This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the, especially to the kids from the Bridges Canada Camp in Ontario, Canada. There are four camps watching us today. If you can believe it, I'm going to read them up because I'm too stupid to remember them. Milton, Burlington, Georgetown, and Oakville, all of you watching us here on safari in South Africa. We're on the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. My name is James Henry. On camera today, we have got Sebastian Rombi. He's from another African country called Gabon, which is in West Africa, an astounding place, no doubt. And that over there is a kudu male. Now, over the next little while, it would be very good if you talked to us while we drive around. And you can do that by asking, I think, your camp counselor or teacher or whatever you call them uh, a question. They will then send them through to us and we'll do our best to answer them. We'll be looking for all sorts of creatures out here. And I've got a, my friend Steph also out. He's, I think, going to some elephants at the moment. That there is an impala, the most common antelope we get here. The kudu, slightly less common, much bigger. And they're all sitting around with each other, of course, because they don't want to be eaten. They are using each other's eyes for security. And in fact, this young kudu is very, very close here. He's just behind this very thick bush. Brook. We do see many endangered species on safari. Well, not that many, but some endangered species. We saw some today. We may see some if I drive very quickly. We're going down towards Woodhole where we saw some wild dogs this morning. They are Africa's painted wolf, or Africa's wolf, basically. They are endangered. That's the most, I suppose, common endangered species that we see here. And we often see, we sometimes see rhino. They are obviously not quite endangered just yet, but very shortly to be. That's the southern white rhino. So, yeah, we do see endangered species over here. Okay, let's continue from here. We're going to head down towards this water hole. Hopefully we'll see some wild dogs. In the meantime, Stefan Winterboer is just around over there looking for elephants. And we haven't, we managed to find these elephants and a welcome to you all from very far away from where we're sitting now, different hemisphere different climate, different time of the year, well, different season, I should say, not different time of the year. And uh, yeah, myself, Steph, and David's on camera, and we have managed to find these elephant. We were with some of these elephant this morning, and I'm glad that they are in virtually the same place as they were. Now, elephant live in herds that are led by a female, and this particular female that you're looking at is the daughter of what we call the matriarch. The matriarch is the oldest, strongest, wisest female elephant and that is her that you're looking at right there. And everyone else in this herd is probably daughters of this old lady. She'll be able to have a baby every five years or so from when she's about 18. We've got a young elephant coming up right behind us. This is probably a young male, and just like naughty teenagers that don't like to be with their moms in a shopping centre, these young males can sometimes come up behind us, and they can be quite um, playful, as this one is. Ooh, nice big ears, you can see how he made his head, made his uh, ears all big. Now, Sarah, you want to know what the lump is on the elephant's back? I'm assuming that you're talking about the one just in front of sort of just in front of half, or just at the back of the halfway, there you can see it in profile. That's their spine. So they carry a lot of weight uh, that needs to be suspended from their spine. And for that they need those, uh, I can't remember what they're called now, but they are basically crests on the spine and muscles attached to that. And to that, all the elephant's weight is suspended. And so that is the spine. And then the front one, the front hump behind their ears, that's their shoulder blades that you can see there. It's the top end of their shoulder blades. You can see how it moves as the elephant walks, left side to right side. Amazing, hey? And those ears that we're having a look at are like big radiators. Now, Thomas, you'd like to know exactly what the elephants are eating. Um, Thomas, they're eating mainly leaves and sticks, roots and bark this time of the year 
Roughly 80% of their diet is made up of leaves and sticks this time of the year and in summertime here, which is from December to March here, uh, they eat almost exclusively grass. So 80% of their diets or so will be made up of grass. Right now, they're feeding up to 20 hours a day because of the fact that the woody material that they eat is not that nutritious. Well, it's actually very nutritious. They just can't eat enough of it, to be honest with you. So they have to eat a lot more of it to get their energy requirements. She is beautiful, isn't she? Long trunk sticking down to the floor. Beautiful symmetrical tusks. Amusa, you'd like to know how heavy is this elephant? Uh, Musa, female elephant can weigh up to three and a half thousand kilograms or three and a half ton. Male elephant can go up to six ton. Oh, he's just been reprimanded. That was an elephant trumpet. And that's just the youngster being seen off by mom. She obviously has got her eye on a morsel that she wants and was seeing him off before he could get it. Looks like she's going to cross the road here now. Oh no, she's going to that bush for a mouthful of green leaves. Now, what's interesting, everybody, have a look at the way this elephant uses the tusks, there we go, and the trunk to feed with. Now, you'll notice that the one tusk is shorter than the other one, and it's on her left side. That's called the slave tusk, and she will use it the same way you use your left or your right hand. So she's a left-tusked elephant. And another thing, which is unique to each individual elephant, is the way that they curl their trunk around food. So what, let's see what she does. She curls her trunk left or right around that branch. Looks like she curls it right. Let's just see if she does that again. Here we go. And right. Here we go. So that happens individual to each elephant. Izzy, you'd like to know how, why are elephants' ears so big? And that's a very good, uh, very good question, Izzy. And it's to keep them cool. An elephant pushes all the blood in their body through their ears. And, uh, and what they do is, uh, is flap them around and that cools them down, the blood in the ears. The blood then goes back into the body, close to the brain, and keeps the body temperature cool. So they're like big radiators, uh, uh, Izzy. And the elephant can wet these radiators when it's really, really hot and the evaporation will cool the blood down even quicker. And another amazing fact is, he, is that 20% of the elephant's skin on its body is made up of its ears. Isn't that just amazing? I sometimes feel like that. When you, just now, after we finish looking here, you'll see that my ears are about as big as an elephant's. Sarah, you'd like to know if elephants get killed, I mean, if people get killed by elephants. Absolutely. Elephants are one of the most dangerous animals out here. And in places where people live uh, off the land and grow crops, elephants are always in trouble with people because they come and they raid the crops. And every now and again, people want to chase elephants away. Elephants are aggressive and they're big and they're nervous and... What we have is, from time to time, elephants killing people, which is sad, but it does happen. All right, we are going to try and get a cool toy to bear with you at the moment. But uh, while we do that, why don't we go and have a look at what James is doing. We found more impala. These ones are out in the open. These ones are big male impala rams. And you can see they're rams by the fact that they've got horns, which of course the females or ewes do not. Now, in amongst the impala, we've got some interesting birds. Uh, Robbie, no, impalas don't hunt. Well, if you're a grass, then I suppose you might think that impalas hunt. They eat grass and they eat leaves from trees. They are not hunting animals. Uh, so they are herbivores, purely herbivores. They don't eat any meat at all. That there is the red-billed hornbill. And he's looking in amongst impala dung, which might sound like a disgusting thing to do. But if you like to eat insects and it's winter time, that's basically where you're going to find most of the insects. 
So that's what he's doing. And then there was, I mean, he's still around, there's another beautiful bird there called a Birchall's starling. And the Birchall's starling is also looking for insects, but it'll eat slightly smaller things than the red-billed hornbill will. There we go. Haley, for the next three months it probably won't rain here at all, if you can believe it. It doesn't rain very much here. We get about 400 millimetres or so. Yeah, well, between 400 and 600 millimetres a year or so. It's probably an average of about 550 millimetres or so. I think in Canada you use the metric system, thankfully. So, 550 millimetres of rain. And it normally falls in big storms between December, January, February and March. And thereafter we get very little rain up until sort of beginning of June. And then June, July, August, September, October, five months, we very seldom get any rain at all. So it can get very dry here. And you can see all the grass is brown and yellow and we're only in July. So come the very hot months of September and October, without any rain, it really will be very dry indeed. Now, Bridges Canada Camp, uh, you are wondering about the amount of effect climate change is having here. Look, it's very difficult to say because, you know, it, sometimes you just have unpredictable weather, especially in Africa. We have very unpredictable weather here, and so to suddenly attribute that unpredictable weather to climate change is perhaps not necessarily correct. Uh, what we are potentially seeing is a warming, so our summers seem to be getting hotter. They do seem to be getting drier. But at the same time, you know, that could just be that we're in a dry spell. So uh, while I'm con personally convinced that climate change is definitely happening, I mean, the evidence is absolutely there, I'm not sure what the effect is over here. So it's difficult to say what effect climate change is having on this particular environment. I think Steph has had some success. We have got a very cool toy to show you. We have got a thermal camera on the vehicle and you're going to go across now to a thermal image of this elephant. This is a FLIR thermal image and what you're seeing there is this elephant's heat signature and a picture generated from the elephant. And isn't that amazing? The red and the yellow are the hot spots. The blue and the purple are cold areas and what I really want you to have a look at is the ears. You can, this elephant has been in the sun the whole day and so her whole body is a bit warm, but you can see the blood vessels in the ears. Now, Sarah, you'd like to know if elephants sweat. Um, wow, let me see if I've ever felt an elephant sweat. I think they do, Sarah. I don't think they sweat as profusely as we do. Humans sweat an incredible a lot, but they do definitely sweat from their skin and then they have glandular secretions as well but what I really want you to have a look at have a look at those ears can you see the blood vessels in the ears radiating from the ear holes which are those dark spots out onto the ears and how cool they are compared to the rest of the body isn't that the most amazing thing and that just goes to prove exactly how well the elephant's ears cool its blood down you can see the tusks absolutely no temperature in their tusks and that's because they don't have blood flow they're like your teeth they've got a root that goes down the middle just a little bit in front of the lip and then the rest is just ivory that is really amazing look how hot her belly is compared to her back and how cool her legs are Now, Daniel, you'd like to know why are they so heated? That's because, Daniel, they are warm-blooded. And so they have internal, they have the ability to, to heat their bodies and keep it at a constant temperature. And that temperature is relatively high, much higher than the bush around it. We have a, a temperature of 37.5 degrees. Elephants have a very similar temperature. And the bush around us at the moment is about 25 degrees, which is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So much cooler and that's why this camera shows up the warm-blooded elephant as such massive hotspots.
you can also see amazingly enough is the trees are very warm behind them. Now Kai, you'd like to know if the tusks get in the way when elephants eat. Absolutely not Kai. They use the tusks like you would use a tool. They pry bark open with them. They break branches. They pick up things with their tusks. They dig with their tusks. They are just the most awesome tool to use. And so no, they don't get in the way at all Kai. I'm going to go forward a little bit. Let's go back to our main cameras, our visual light and then you can see my elephant ears while I'm driving a little bit closer to these elephants so that we can watch them disappear into this thick bush. Now my ears don't work nearly as well as cooling me down unfortunately. I have to spray my whole head with water to get that done but uh, nevertheless. Now these elephants are moving off quite quickly. Now. Vlad, you'd like to know how hot it is here. Vlad, it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees centigrade. And that's pretty high for a, what is a winter's day here. We very rarely get to freezing, but we do sometimes get to the single digits in centigrade. And in summertime, it'll go up to 50 degrees centigrade, which I think is about 100 and, I'm not too sure, about 150, 120 maybe even a little bit more in terms of Fahrenheit. So there's a massive swing here between summer and winter. Lily, you'd like to know how elephants drink. They suck water up with their trunks, Lily, about 12 liters or so, and they blow it then into their mouths. So they suck it up with their trunk, blow it into their mouths, Lily. But young elephants that are younger than six months old, don't know how to use their trunks that well just yet and they will bend down and put their mouths into the water and drink like that. They go down on their knees and they put their whole head in the water and suck up the water like that. Look how those elephants just disappear into the bush. Eh? Very very good at disappearing into the bush and because they've got feet very like you and me, so the bottom of our feet are made up of a fleshy pad covered in, well, a fleshy pad around a bone covered in some skin. And that is exactly what an elephant's foot looks like. It's a fleshy pad, very similar to our feet, that is covered uh, in some tough skin. And they can walk very quietly through the bush. On sand, they can be almost, you, you can almost not even hear them. Same as if you or I had to walk into the bush just on sandy paths and we'll make very little, very little noise. So I'm going to see if I can get a little bit closer to these elephant inside this particular drainage line and uh, while I do that why don't we go and have a look at James who from time to time makes a lot of noise. You make a lot of noise sometimes. I would have made a lot of noise if I'd seen what happened here this morning. So I told you about those wild dogs we wanted to see. Uh, we don't know if they're around just yet. I've just arrived here now. What we have there is their kill. Now we're not going to look at that for very long because it's pretty disgusting. But they killed it today. It's a bushbuck. It was a bushbuck. It's no longer a bushbuck. They ate all of the good stuff. And because there were only two of them, they didn't manage to finish it. Now normally they would finish a kill and move off and then sleep for the rest of the day. But they haven't finished this one because, they were, like I said, there are only two of them. But there are vultures all over the trees here. And the fact that the vultures in the trees are not on the ground eating this carcass tells me that maybe these dogs are quite close by. So we're going to scan this area. I can't see them right now, so we'll drive, hope, we'll drive a little bit further forward. Julie, you know, most animals out here are not dangerous or deadly unless you really irritate them. Elephants can be particularly deadly if you try and ir if you manage to irritate them. And it's just a question of knowing what irritates them, why it irritates them, and when it's going to irritate them. So you've noticed how Steph operated around that elephant herd. He was very quiet, he's very respectful, 
and so they didn't get irritated with him. If they had had a little baby with them, then they, he would have spent a little, or he would have separated himself a little bit more from them, increased the distance so that they didn't become too afraid by that. But basically, you know, no animal out here is going to try and kill you. But that said, you do need to be careful of animals, and in fact, the animal that kills the most people or well, the mammal that kills the most people in Africa every year is the hippopotamus. Hippos kill quite a lot of people and that's because people obviously need to drink water and in a lot of African areas you know it's it's very it's very rural. A lot of African areas are very rural which means that there is a, a need for people to go down to rivers and to dams and to fetch water and there they come in contact with hippopotamus and that can be quite dangerous. But that doesn't happen a lot. I mean they probably kill as many people in Africa as sharks kill people. Common, the vultures we've just seen are about this big. So if, you, if they were standing there, that's a white-backed vulture and probably about that big. So just over a, sort of almost a foot and a half. 90 centimeters or so. There's a white-backed vultures, almost all of them. Now I was just looking around here because there's shade and there used to be some water but there isn't water here at the moment. So I'm not sure where these doggies have headed off to. I'm very surprised that those vultures are not around there. Alrighty, we'll have another look around here. While we do that, let's go back to Steph, who's still looking at his hot elephants. We are still looking at our hot elephants. We're in a very nice spot here to see the matriarch, the leader, the mommy of this group. And you're looking at that fantastic FLIR image, that thermal image again, where you can see that even the tip of the trunk is relatively cool compared to the rest of the body. Now Musa, you'd like to know at what temperature an elephant can survive and to be honest with you Musa, they can survive even in the deserts of Namibia. Uh, Alright, now what we're going to do is we're just going to let this female elephant do what she needs to do. She's going to be coming past us relatively close and all I'm going to do is keep on talking to her. Hello girl. We, there we go. Hello. We're right amongst these elephants. Right in between them. I mean, that was two meters away from the front of the car. Isn't that just the most amazing thing? That they're so trusting. And it's because this has been a game reserve for over a hundred years. And we don't hunt these animals here. We don't chase them away. We are very respectful of them. They have the right of way and they decide the terms of how we interact with them absolutely. And you could see that if the matriarch is relaxed, the rest of the herd will be totally relaxed with us. Here comes a little baby. Now Arden, you'd like to know if a baby elephant holds on to its mother's tail. They absolutely do if they really need to. Young elephants for the first five years of their life are almost never out of sight of their mothers and quite often within touch the whole time as well. Isn't that awesome? This is now one of her calves. This calf is about five years old. And we're going to go back to that fantastic thermal image of these elephants through the bush. And you saw as we left there that these elephants are virtually invisible in the bush but their heat signature sticks out. Now, there was a question of how hot elephant can live, or the temperatures that they can live in, and they can live into temperatures uh, way exceeding 50 degrees. But Musa, their skin temperature on their head and their back can also exceed 50 degrees centigrade. That's the portion of their body that gets the most light or the most sunlight. And quite often, if there's just a little bit of mud around, they'll spray mud onto their backs and their heads and behind their ears, and that's to cool them down. And to reduce that temperature. Right now you can see that there's a coolish wind blowing and that her back 
is relatively cool compared to the warmer areas between her front legs for instance is one of the warmest places uh, Cole you would like to know how can I tell whether it's a male or a female why don't we have a look at these elephants approaching us on the right hand side and I'll see if I can show you so we've got some young elephants that are going to come right past us on the right hand side we're going to go to our normal camera for this now look at the side of their head you can see that this elephant has an angle on the side of their head it's like a point there we go you can see it's roughly 90 degrees that's a female elephant a male elephant is very round doesn't have that little point so that's about the easiest way female elephants have that angle male elephants have a round bulge She's also got a baby with her. Look at them all together there now. Isn't that just the most amazing sighting? Relaxed African elephant, the largest land mammals to walk the planet. Totally, totally relaxed with us here. Now, Lucas, at what age does a young elephant leave the herd? I'm gathering, Lucas, that you're thinking about doing the same thing at one point, eh? Well, female elephant will stay with their herd almost their entire life. But if the herd gets too big, in this particular area, if the herd gets bigger than 12 individuals, quite often sisters, older sisters, will break apart, taking their children with them and forming new herds. So... Generally, female elephants stick together for their whole lives. Male elephant leave anywhere from about 15 to 25 years old. Male elephant will walk away from the herd. What happens though, Lucas, is they, they gradually get left behind. And uh, look at this naughty elephant coming to sneak up on us here. Through. He's playing a bit of a game with us here through the leaves. He's got the height advantage with us and he came rushing up. Let's see what he does. Here he's pushing the leaf away. He's playing hiding go seek with us. This is a young male. And he's, he's quite boisterous. Let's see what he does. I've got a feeling that he's probably going to walk right up to us. What he's doing with his trunk there is swishing grass. He's not really eating. He's just playing like he's eating. He's making us believe that he's eating. When in actual fact he wants to run up behind us. See how he spits out the grass? He's eating a little bit of it. Mainly it's just a big show. And it's called displacement behavior. Ashton, you like to know how strong these elephants are. Ashton, I'm driving in a Land Rover, which is about as strong a car as you get. And an elephant, I can't push over some of the trees that these elephants can push over. So much stronger than the Land Rover that I'm driving around now. And in some cases, I've been absolutely amazed at the size of the trees that these elephant can push over much bigger than what you can encircle with your arms. So hold your arms out as wide as you can and then touch your fingertips together. That is why elephants can push over a tree with a diameter of, of trunk much wider than that. Let's see what this youngster is going to do. You think he's going to use the tree to come and sneak up on us? Let's see, no, he's still busy hiding there behind the tree. What I'm expecting him to do is when we're not looking at him, he's going to run over here and maybe give us a bit of a trumpet. That shakes his head, runs down the hill. Oh, you're a big boy. Yeah. Now, Arden, you'd like to know how an elephant stampede begins. Arden, usually what happens is they get a fright. And once they get a fright, they do one of two things. Firstly, what they normally do is all push together. They push their bottoms together and they face outwards and they face the threat. And then what they do, Arden, is if the threat can be run away from, they don't need to fight it, they then flee. And what that means is they rush off very quietly. They rush in a, in, in a whooshing, silent rush. Um, sometimes if they're very scared, they'll make small trumpet noises and they run off at... 45 kilometers an hour now 45 kilometers an hour is about 30 miles an hour i think and rush off into the bush and that we call a stampede 
Now, if you're standing in front of these elephants with a stampede and they don't know you there, they can come upon you very, very fast. I have a story. A couple of months ago, I was standing in the bush. We were just minding our own business. We heard some branches cracking and an elephant stampede came tumbling down the side of a hill. And we had to make a very loud noise. And those elephants then turned away from us. We were shouting and clapping, clapping our hands, waving like this in the air. And eventually what happened was those elephants realized, oh, there's some people there, and turned away and trumpeted off in the other direction. But we came very close to being stepped on by an elephant. Not my favorite thing. Right, I see these Ellies have moved on a little bit. We're going to get into a little bit of a better position before James's guinea fowl fly away. Why don't you go and have a look at them? Guinea fowls are a spectacular bird, I think. They live on the ground, they've got beautiful feathers, and of course they've got ridiculous helmets on their heads. They're called helmeted guinea fowl because of those ridiculous helmets on their heads. And they're a little bit like a bush chicken, I suppose. You can eat them. They don't taste very good. They taste a little bit like boiling a roll of string in apricots and then eating that. Some people say it tastes, they taste nice. I disagree. Much better seeing them wandering around here, feeding on grass seeds. Cole, you say, what is my accent? It sounds great. Um, first of all, thank you very much. You're not many people who say that about my accent, but uh, my accent, Cole, is South African with a, uh, well, that's, that's what it is. I've only ever lived in South Africa. I might sound a little bit English to some people. I don't sound English to English people, uh, from England, I mean, uh, but from... Some South Africans think I sound a bit English, but uh, I am South African. That's what my accent is. Steph's got another kind of South African accent, which is a little bit less English than, than mine. Bryce, that is the way that evolution has made them. That's why they look like they do. Their shape helps them to survive in this environment. I'm not really sure exactly why it is that they're shaped precisely like they are. They are very fast runners though, and so their legs are designed like that so that they can run very quickly. They live, you see, predominantly on the ground. That's where they feed. So they don't fly to find their food. They walk around and run around to fly their feed, to find their fee feed, and so they need to be able to run very quickly if they can because obviously sometimes they will be chased by predators on the ground. They can also fly very well to escape predators, but they do need to be able to run quickly. And in fact, you know what? Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, there have been recently, not recently, I think the 400 meter sprint record was broken last year by a South African called Wayne Fannikirk. And I forget exactly how fast he ran the 400 meters in. I think it was in something like 43.18 seconds. It was very fast indeed. Uh, anyway, he broke a record that Michael Johnson had held, I think, for something silly like 12 years, which is uh, almost unheard of. This humble bird that you're looking at over there, the guinea fowl, I'm reliably told could run the 400 meters, assuming you could make it run in a straight line in about 38 seconds. So they are seriously fast and I would pay very good money to watch a guinea fowl like this racing Wayne van Niekerk around a 400 meter track and even more money to watch him being beaten by a guinea fowl <laughs> squawking away. So that doesn't really explain why they look a bit like chickens, but I suppose they have the same feeding strategy as chickens. You know, they walk around on the ground and try and find things to eat there. Zara, some of the name animals here have nicknames. Uh, we have character animals that we see regularly, the predators. So we've got leopards that have actual names. They don't know their names, but we call them their, by their names. Uh, one of the leopards we'd see in this particular area here is called Kuchava, 
and that means she who is afraid. I'm not sure where she got that name because she doesn't seem afraid of much. But so if we saw her, we'd call her Guchava. And if we saw her mother, we'd call her Tandi, which means beloved. So yes, some of the animals that we see more regularly have got nicknames. I mean, I don't know what the nickname of that particular guinea fowl you're looking at is. Maybe it's Scratch or Peck, but it would be very difficult to tell the difference between him and any of the other guinea fowl in his flock. It might even be a she. And then with big group animals like the hyenas and, in fact, the wild dogs and the lions, what happens is that we name them after the group, so we'd call the lions after the lion pride, so it would be the Unkuhuma pride, as opposed to naming all the individuals within the pride. Sarah, it's impossible to tell male from female here. They all look exactly the same, so they do not exhibit what we call sexual dimorphism. You don't really need to remember that, but that's the term that we use for birds that look different or any animals that look different, male and female, they look exactly the same. You might find that there's a slight weight difference, where the males are either slightly bigger or smaller than the females. Often with birds, the females are a little bit smaller, unlike with mammals, at least a little bit bigger, unlike with mammals. And I'll just quickly actually check the weight of these things. I've got a very nice bird app that I can do that on. Can't remember at all, you see, getting old and all that. Now, sexes are completely alike, but the male is slightly larger than the female. So they only weigh about 1.3 kilograms, which is not very big at all. Right, Stefan is still with his elephants, so you can pop back to them and have a last look. Oh, and something else. We have got something else. Not only do we have the world's heaviest and largest walking mammal, but we also got the world's tallest mammal. We got a giraffe. Look at that. That is a male giraffe. He's bald on top of his horns, just like me, or my head at least, is bald, just like this giraffe. And he's been chased out of his afternoon rest in the shade by this herd of elephants. And you can see by the look on his face, not very pleased with him for doing that. Now they stand five and a half meters tall at the top of their head. Five and a half meters tall? That's like, what is that, 15 feet? Almost 20 feet? And it's so that they can reach bushes and branches that are way out of reach of everyone else. Now Christian, you'd like to know how giraffes sleep. Christian, they sleep lying down, but just like we do, but they don't sleep for very long. I've read some reports that giraffe only sleep between 20 and 40 minutes every 24 hours. But it's most likely the case that they sleep for a couple of minutes across the evening and that they will lie down for most of the evening. But isn't that just amazing? Sleeping, lying down, that big giraffe. But what they do do is they chew the cud very similar to a cow or to a very similar to a cow or to a, uh, a, a sheep or a goat and so they lie down quite often just on their bellies with their heads sticking up and chew the cud for many hours so they eat all the leaves during the day and then at night time they chew their cud making it smaller and easier to digest now Thomas You've asked a nice question, how did giraffe go down and then get back up again? Thomas, they do it by first going down basically, let me think of how a giraffe goes down. First they go down on their knees, their front knees, so they bend their knees down and then they go back on their, on their bellies. So standing like this, they bend their knees and then go down on their bellies and crunch down like that. And, uh, and basically, they can stand up and, and, and uh, lie down relatively quickly. It's not, uh, it's not too much of a hassle for them. Um, it just looks a bit ungainly when you've got something that tall uh, lying down. Now, this elephant is getting stuck into the bushes. <laughs> Chloe, you ask a nice question. Why do elephants swing their tails? 
Chloe, do you know what? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I think that they do it for biting flies and biting insects. Um, there's a lot of parasites that like to bite uh, elephants. You get a fly out here called a hippo fly that uh, loves to suck the blood of elephants. And I think that the tail swishes for them, except that I never see any insects coming off of the tail, to be honest. You can have a look there carefully across the body of the elephant. Can you see any flies, especially flies with, uh, with mouth parts big enough to stick through an elephant skin? But what we can do, why don't we go and have a look at that awesome shot of the fleur image, the thermal image of this elephant. She's now super close. Have a look at that. Look at all those color spots that she's got all over. But of note there, look at the cold grass and her ears that have got those cold patches with all the blood vessels radiating from the center and out through there. Uh, Caleb, Caleb, female giraffe will probably eat, a, I mean, excuse me, female giraffe, female elephant will probably eat about a hundred kilograms of grass or leaves and twigs and all leaves and twigs, roots, fruit, everything that they can put into their mouth from a vegetable point of view. They will eat about a hundred, maybe a little bit more than a hundred kilograms, so about 200 pounds of food in a day. Male elephant, which are double the size, need double the food, about 200 kilograms of food every day. Look at that picture. Isn't that just the most amazing thing? All right, we're going back to our normal light so we can have a look at this elephant just feeding in this beautiful low area, this river area. Now, this is a dry riverbed. And uh, our friend James, he's definitely not at a place that is dry. I'm not at a place that is dry, no, I'm at a waterhole. I'm at a, the Chitwa waterhole. That's uh, because it's just near a lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. And in Lake Chitwa, we have got some hippopotami. Lots of them. They're very quiet, very lazy animals. They don't like to work too hard. Oh, Kai, the inevitable who will win question. Who will win between a hippopotamus and an elephant? Well, an elephant weighs roughly 5,000 kilograms, a big bull, up to 6,000 kilograms. A uh, big bull hippopotamus weighs about 2,500 kilograms. So a big bull elephant is more than twice the size of a big hippopotamus bull and out here it's pretty much only size that counts so an elephant will thrash a hippopotamus should the knees ar need arise and sometimes they will chase them out of water and sometimes if water is really limited they might get hold of them and actually kill them it's very unusual and it only happens when it's extremely dry and the elephants and the hippos are fighting for the same water sources. You'd never see it in a place like this unless you found a particularly stupid hippopotamus that decided he wanted to take on the might of an elephant. Even an elephant cow will weigh about four and a half, well, no, three and a half tons, which is enormous. Ooh. And there we've got a special bird. That's a special bird called a spoonbill. Can you see there that its bill or its beak is shaped like a spoon? So it's one of the few birds that is easy to remember because it's called a spoonbill and it looks like it has a spoon attached to the front of its face. Bryce, back to the hippos. Uh, you asked why they're so fat. They're so fat because they live in water all the time. Now, if you were to take that thermal camera that Steph's been using and you were to shine it on these hippos, basically what happens is all you can see is a hot spot coming from the ears, the eyes, and a little bit from the nose. The rest of the body is insulated by this thick layer of fat. And what it acts as is a giant warming device. So it stays in water. I mean, it's, it's pretty chilly out here at the moment. I'd say this water is probably not much more than 16 degrees or so, which you and I would find very cold to swim in. But because a hippo is so fat, it is insulated from the cold. Very much in the same way that a whale is covered in a thick layer of blubber, which keeps it warm. Because without that, hippos, of course, are mammals, and without that thick layer of blubber, they'd get very cold very quickly. 
Sarah, this is what a hippo sounds like. <laughs> That's what they sound like. They also make a loud bellowing noise, which sounds like this. When they're having a fight. Kirsten, go again with that. I was making hippo noise. She's the director. She's very scary. All right. Guys, enjoy your camp. We don't have camps in South Africa. They sound like a lot of fun. I hope you're having a good time there. Not missing home too much. Don't forget to write to your parents on actual paper, possibly. Uh, until next time, we see you on safari. Have an enjoyable rest of your day. For the rest of you, let's go back across to Steph and we'll see what else we can find here. Behind you, but we're being played with by a young elephant that is basically just using the cover of the car to come right up behind us and wants to give David a tap on his uh, on his shoulder. These youngsters are very boisterous. Once he's going to come up, kick some sand. That's no more than three meters away from us. Now you've got to be careful with these things because although it's a game for this little guy. The mom might take offense at the fact that we're playing a game with her baby, and so you've always got to be careful about what uh, what you do. Excuse that aerial that's in the shot there. It's just how we communicate with each other, and this little elephant chose the back quarter of the car to come and sneak up on us, and so we have got that vertical stripe through there. It is un an unfortunate necessity. Now, where are you going to go? Are you stuck? You snookered yourself now. He has to choose now between embarrassing himself by walking through the bushes or backtracking. Let's see what he does. <laughs> Come on, you don't need to be like that. We'll play your game. Come run up, do your thing, get it out of your system. You're a big scary elephant, we know. Now, there's, these games are all in preparing elephant for when they get older and the games that they'll have to play amongst themselves turn into serious combat with, uh, with male elephant. They will sometimes fight each other to the death. I've only seen it happen once um, where an elephant was incredibly injured or badly injured. I, sh I should really stop using that word. Badly injured. Okay, there we go. No, 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 no. You can kick a ball. Well done. Now where are you going to go? Now, if I had to start the car and create some distance, it will scare him. Oh, no, no, hey, man. <laughs> so he even kicked with his back leg. Sorry, bud. Kicking some sand at us, turning, rushing away. <laughs> Are we standing in the dust? Now what? Now you're just leaving us and running away. No, no, leave that tree alone. It's done nothing to you. Let's give him some space to get to his mom. Saving some face, so we'll give him a little bit of space and he'll come back down. Hopefully, he'll come back down here. So, here he comes. Now we've given him some space. Let's see what he does. So, when he was right close like that, you don't want to start the car and, and give him a big fright. That's not what we need to do to these youngsters. We don't need to give them a big fright and make them uh, make them very scared of the cars. We just want to make sure that he understands we're not his toy, but we're also not scared of him because you can't have an elephant that that teaches himself how to bully cars around, get get into adulthood. He's got a dangerous. That is dangerous. Now, giraffe girl, you say he just wants to play, and absolutely, that's exactly what he's busy doing. He's just a youngster testing out his muscles, doesn't quite understand why everything else in the jungle runs away from him when he does that, but not us. And um, he's just flexing his bicep, for lack of a better word, you know, these youngsters. Now, he's moved across over that termite mound. He didn't take our opening to come uh, through here, and so I'm assuming that he'll probably walk off to mom. There's elephants everywhere where we are here now. This is a young bull as well, and teenager walking through this island of green. He's now following the rest of the herd. Now, 
we were we were talking about how with the schools we were just talking about how bull elephant how long bull elephants stay with the herds and basically what happens is a young bull like this will gradually get left well he will choose to fall further and further behind the herd and as he gets bigger and bigger and bigger he will eventually lose contact with the herd and will then start to wonder now because these youngsters do miss company um, but they are receptive to female hormones um, they're not tolerated around herds and that makes them a bit lonely and quite often you find young bull elephant will join uh, much older elephant elephant that are not fighting for breeding rights anymore and become their ascaris their escorts basically and they learn lots of things during this period of their lives and so it's very important in elephant society to have lots of old bull elephant which wander around and know all the secret pathways and all the places in the forest uh, teaching the young bulls exactly how to behave what to do when and to some degree also to learn some bad habits but mostly just to pass on their knowledge what happens then is these young bulls become a little bit older and anywhere from about 45 years old or so they are, are in the prime of their life and big enough to fight with other bulls for mating rights with females so at that point they leave these bachelor herds or these loose associations of, of bulls and they start wandering from elephant herd to elephant herd to elephant herd and when they find a female in estrus they then um, they then contest with other bull elephants and if they're strong enough uh, they will win breeding rights and then their genes get passed down into the elephant that gets born and, and hopefully through the ages and then when he's finished with all of that when he's finished with all of that then they just start wondering but because by that stage they're on their last set of teeth generally these wanderings take them in ever tightening circles around the last bits and pieces of vegetation that they can chew and can forage on which generally happens in swampy areas and alongside river courses and this is where the elephants pass away and where their bones get then washed into into rivers and during flood times these bones are collected and deposited in groups in eddies and on sandbanks and this gets deeper with every passing year of sediment and new elephant bones get added and over the years what's happened is people have come to believe that there's these elephant graveyards around which is not untrue uh, but basically the graveyard is the river course but the deposit of bones is because the river picks up these bones and then deposits them into these areas now that white sleep in the eye is a hormonal secretion Now, Paula, you've asked an interesting question. If elephants get lonely, is it true that they'll hold their own tails? Paula, while I can't discount that as being feasible at all, I've never seen it myself. Um, I've seen them, I've basically seen them uh, uh, grooming themselves. They rub their eyes, they dig in their ears, they reach bet you know, under their tail to give themselves a scratch. Um, I've never seen one physically grab its tail. I've seen other elephants holding the tail of the elephant in front of them, very similar to how you see in the, in the picture books. Um, but no, lonely elephant, I don't think, uh, hold their own tails. Um, but it is possible. I mean, you know, some people sleep with their fingers in their mouths and, you know, do so into adulthood as well. All right, speaking of loners, James must be quite lonely at the moment. Why don't you go and uh, find out what he's been keeping himself busy with? I'm not very lonely, actually. I'm quite good at being alone, and I'm not alone. I'm with Sebastian Rombi, the greatest French Gabonese Air Force pilot in history. Uh, you say Gabon does actually have an Air Force, does it? Yes. What did they fly? Oh, I don't know. N no, Spitfires, perhaps. Anyway, uh, so I haven't been alone. From an animal point of view, we have been alone. The wind continues to pound out of the southeast uh, with a really rather frigid 
feel to it and that's driving the animals into the thick bush. Now I'm very interested by the fact that this bush buck has been left where it is. I'm not surprised the wild dogs aren't there with it. I would be most surprised to find them snacking on the same thing they'd killed this morning. It's not their style. They only eat fresh meat, almost as a rule. I'm sure if they were desperate, they'd eat, you know, they'd go to a uh, semi-rotting carcass. They have not moved it or touched it since we were last here. But there are so many vultures around. And what's very interesting is that there are no feathers on the ground either, which tells me that the vultures haven't even descended to have a, a sort of test of the bushbuck. And that indicates that there could easily be another predator around somewhere that's chased them off. But if it's a leopard, I'd have expected the leopard to dry, sort of drag it into the cover and at least have eaten something. If there was a lion, well, they'd have devoured it in three and a half seconds. Likewise, a hyena. I can't think of a predator that would have left it on the road like that. So it's rather a mystery as to why the vultures are not eating it. Unless the dogs are close by and they've chased the vulture so many times. Romit, almost universally herbivores are the worst defenders of each other you can imagine. Now, I will give you the example of the migration last year, where we watched the five cheetah brothers. They, they gave us a wonderful show just about every single week. They would get in amongst a herd of wildebeest, say 100, 150, sometimes up to 1,000, scatter them because they became so fearful, run in all directions, then they'd home in on one, grab it, and kill it. Now, I only once saw a bull wildebeest turn around and hit one of the cheetah. He knocked it off the baby they jumped on, but he then just carried on running. So the cheetah got back to the baby and killed it regardless. And the logic is, of course, that there is no reason on earth why they wouldn't be able to chase off all of the cheetah's attentions. If they stood their ground and protected each other, they'd all survive. But they just don't. So there's the bush buck. I'm just going to give you one last look and then we're going to leave this area. I've done a whole loop around. You see it there? See it? I've parked you on a beautiful angle, haven't I? And no one helped this bushbuck, as Kirsten says. But that, of course, is because bushbuck are solitary animals. I'm just communicating with Dylan Leo Smith, Brent's brother, who's dri driven in with some guests. But they don't know where the dogs are either. Oh, that's a very sad scene, if you happen to be a bushbuck lover. All right, let's go over to Stefan Winterbull, who's find some home animals that do actually help each other. Yeah, they do, actually. These are some dwarf mongoose that we've got. But interestingly, they're in a refuge, a termite mound. And what we want to show you is the flare image of, uh, of this termite mound, because we always say that these, these uh, mongoose go into the termite mounds because they're warm and now we can show you so there you're having a look at that colored image that fantastic thermal image um, and you can clearly see that the cavities in the in the termite mound are much hotter than outside and it's not from the sun because otherwise the tops and the sides would be a uniform color this is just generally from the heat generated by all those termites working towards uh, working towards making sure that the air conditioner works well have a look how cold the noses are of these mongoose yeah, that is such an awesome picture who knows if they're going to sleep inside this particular uh, cavity tonight they might do you know it's a cold day today relatively speaking i think they might wrap up early tonight these uh, these mongoose hopefully they've got enough food through their foraging today and their feet are cold as well shame <laughs> no wonder they no wonder they go into these termite mounds if i had feet that blue i'd also go and hide away in something that orange the whole mound is shining huh? 
That is really cool. Yes, these sphere images are just totally amazing. I'm absorbed by this uh, by this particular camera. Then in the background, you can see some more some things. Oh, it's the elephant really moving throughout the bush there. Big grey thing that's coming out there. That's an elephant. Can't even see it with my naked eye to tell you the honest truth, but there it is. I have a look. Now you're back into visible light and you can see how thick the bush is and why I couldn't even see that elephant and how fantastic that image is that it sort of brings out those ellies. And you can have a look at the termite mound we've been looking at. You can see it's in the direct sunlight and yet those cavities were blood warm. Now it's about 31 degrees inside a termite mound and you can see that that heat is coming out there. No wonder these uh, these young mongoose or these mongoose, small mongoose, basically go inside there. Let's go and have a look at that thermal image again. Well, we've got these mongoose sitting on top of their termite mound. Really cool. Now, Angie, you've asked a nice question. Why were the why are the uh, mongoose's eyes warm and the elephant's eyes were cold? Um, Angie, it's because at that angle that we are looking at the elephants from, we can't actually see their eyeball. What we're seeing is a, is the, basically the eyebrow, um, which is overhanging their eyeball, and their eyeballs are downcast towards the tip of their trunk and their feet. So unless the elephant was actually looking up and looking at us, um, we would have seen just the bony casket above the eye. So if you take your fingers and you feel your eyebrows, basically anything below the eyebrow onto the eyelid uh, was what we were looking at to the elephant. And that is relatively cold, comparatively speaking. Um, whereas the mongoose have got protruding eyes and uh, it gives, there's another elephant walking through the thicket in the background. <laughs> That's really cool. And um, their eyes protrude a little without that bony casing around it that shields it. And so that's why we can see their eyes sticking out uh, a lot more. Is it possible to go a little bit tighter, Dave? Yeah. Let's go and have a look at uh, and see. Now these, these cameras are quite difficult when it's fully cropped like this. It's quite difficult to get a good focus on them. But uh, Rachel, you'd like to know how big these mongoose are compared to meerkats. Um, Rachel, I'd say that a meerkat is probably double the length of these mongoose, but body-wise, they're probably about the same circumference, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so if you've ever seen a slender mongoose out here, that's about the size uh, of the... Uh, let's go and have a look at these mongoose again while I explain the size difference in, uh, in normal light. So here we go. Let's go up. So, about the same circumference, but about double as long um, for a uh, for a meerkat or suricate, as they're also named. These are the smallest members of the mongoose family, though. So mongoose and meerkats, these are the smallest one, with the largest one being the white-tailed mongoose, that's probably about five or six times bigger than this. And these are the smallest guys, and there you can see those protruding eyes. Now, Gary, you've asked how far down do the mongoose go into the termite mound? Um, Gary, from termite mounds that I've excavated, um, the, the, the big chambers that, are, that they're living in, that I'm assuming that they're living in, because they're not going to excavate things too much down there, lie probably about a meter, so three feet or so below uh, what we're seeing now. So I'm assuming, I don't know, but I'm assuming that they probably go down to those chambers. Um, and in this term, I'm mound about a meter or so uh, in. <clears throat> in larger termite mounds, it can go down. You can stand up in one of these cavities. I, I did it once on a bushwalk where I climbed into a cavity that was hollowed out by a porcupine or a hyena or a warthog. And uh, that's probably about a meter and a half or so down. So three to five feet or so. They're really getting themselves nicely sunned. Now this one is not eating obviously and standing in the open and is the sentry is the sentry for this particular group. Right, but we're going to move on, look for something else. Why don't we go and have a look at James who's apparently found or spotted something spotted.
Well, we have spotted something spotted. We didn't spot the spotted thing. This was spotted thing was spotted by one of the spotters on the front of one of the cars, also out spotting game today. And, uh, well, he spotted it with an excellent application of spotting techniques. Now, Herbert, if you are there, this is Tingana, I think, and he's just inside Torchwood on the valley of the great Molwanini. So they had him this morning. I've just found out, you can tell Herbert, that they had Tingana in this area this morning. So the tracks of the mail that Herbert was following, I don't think, were Tingana. Which is quite interesting. Um, Kirsten, I'm tempted to just drive down the road a little bit and see if we can get a slightly better view, because obviously this is not the best view of the leopard we've ever had on Safari Live, but I am also a little bit worried about the signal. So, will you just keep me posted? You will keep me posted? Let's just try and see what happens. I shall engage the low range. <sighs> Alrighty. Kirsten says I can write the technical report if we lose signal. Kirsten, you will write the tech report because you're the director. I am but a servant to your whims. That means I do what you tell me, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Except write reports. I don't do that when you tell me to. How's the signal now? Is it all right? It's all right? It's all right signal? Signal all right? This is going to be the best view, I yeah. believe. How's that? Yeah. There we are. Oh, the signal's getting stronger and stronger. You can write the report for that. Right, that's much better. Now, is that Tingana? Yes, I'm pretty sure it is. Yes, that looks like him. Mm. Hello, old fellow. Who's been stomping on your ground earlier today, huh? Very interesting. Yes. Our King Ting. Thank you for that, Joe. He's very relaxed. He's looking very bulky at the moment, which is excellent. But I do wonder who Herbert's been tracking. Herbert was tracking a male leopard all the way in the far north. There's something about a leopard on a termite mound that just makes them look like they belong, I feel. Uh, Ravinda, what was that? About something view the game drive radio went it's as your question view. came through. It's an excellent view. Oh, an excellent view. Yes, it is an excellent view, Ravinda, of Tingana the male leopard. It'd be nice to go and park a little bit closer to this termite mound. It is on Torchwood, unfortunately, which means that that is not possible. All right, Steph's got a better view of some elephants, so we're going to go across to him. I'm going to wait here and just see what this leopard does. As is so often the case, we are immediately left with nothing to show you the second you come across to us. <laughs> Come, let's just go up this hill a little bit. We just got a little bit of a hill. This is a very large herd of elephants in actual fact. We just saw a small portion of it. They've just been streaming across uh, this area in front of us. And I think if we just stick where we are, we will see a few more. Oh, look, there's a baby. A much older female as well. Oh, okay, now you've asked, you've asked, Kaina, Kaina, you've asked me a nice question, you know, how old is the oldest elephant here? That is actually a difficult question to answer, but I did go to the Litaba Elephant Museum 
which is at, located at Lataba Rest Camp, which houses the tusks of the seven largest elephant uh, to have lived in recent memory. And um, they've carbon dated the tusks of these elephants. And the elephant, surprisingly, were only 55 years old or so. Um, but there are records of elephant living up to 65 years, and I would imagine even 75 years. An elephant that's in the road in front of us. But it's all vegetation dependent, Kena. Now, why I say that is elephants get six sets of teeth. You only get two sets of teeth, or we only get two sets of teeth. Elephant gets six sets of teeth. And when their last set of teeth is gone, then basically they just have gums to chew the vegetation. They can't chew enough of it. They get weak, and eventually they'll pass on. Now, the age of the elephant will be dependent on when they lose their last set of teeth. And that is dependent on the vegetation that they eat. And so, if they're in an area like this, where for three or four months of the year, they're almost exclusively eating trees, they'll wear down their teeth a lot quicker than if they were in an area that had reeds, for instance, or grass all year round. Um, and so I think that here we're looking at, let's say, 55 to a max maybe of 60, maybe a little bit older than that. So I would imagine that the oldest elephant in this area is about 60 to 62, 63. Most probably, though, the average is much less than that, around 55. These elephants that, uh, that are housed, or the, the remains of these elephants and their history um, of these, these, uh, these seven elephants, um, are, is very well documented and um, yeah I would imagine that that is exactly at 55 to 65 years old excuse me yeah 55 to 60 years old with the max age maybe going out to 62 to 65 maybe maybe all right let's go and have a look at Tingana he's finally stood up James. Yeah. Are we live? Yes. Oh, sorry about that, everybody. My radio came out. I was shouting at Dylan Leo Smith. I wasn't shouting at him. I was trying to be friendly to him. Now, Tingana's headed off into Chitra, which is excellent news. Let's continue. Sorry about that. I... I think he's going to go and pick up that bush buck now. Sorry about that signal breakup. It is entirely expected in that area, but it should be okay. It'll be all right here. It'll be a little bit dark, but it should be okay. And you still see him. He'll be just in here. There he goes. Just have a quick look, and then I'm going to move forward, because I think he's going straight to that bush buck. There we go. Sorry, Sebastian, I didn't mean to drive quite so quickly off. We won't be able to spend all afternoon here. There are going to be 58,000 people coming to look at Tingana in a very short space of time. So we'll pull out pretty much as soon as he picks up the bush buck. I wonder if we shouldn't just go straight there. We're not far. Let's wait here. We might get a view of him coming through there, through that clearing. Just going to wait here. So Kirst, I think stay with us unless Stefan finds wild dogs eating an elephant, because like I say, we're not going to be able to spend all afternoon with him. That road up ahead, in fact, down towards the kill is not far away. There he comes. Can you see him there? Yeah. There he is. Old soldier. Come on, boy. Keep going. There's a meal in it for you if you keep on going. That a lovely shot of a leopard slinking through 
the bushes. There he comes. Just saying hello to you there, you saw. Here, leopards scavenge a lot, all the time, I think. They're really not shy to have a good hard scavenge. And so, yes, I suppose maybe it does increase a little bit as they get older, but none of them will be shy to scavenge, especially from wild dogs, interestingly. Let's see if we can get another view here. Not far from the bush buck now. There he's coming there. You see him, Seb? It's very thick. Let's, shall we carry on? This was the little, that was the little path we took down towards, as he crossed the road. It was a little path we took down towards that dry water hole. I think he has, he's crossed. Okay, let's go to the bush buck. Yeah, he's coming for his meal. Yum, yum. How's that? I'm just going to pull off the road because Dylan's also going to need to come and see. Is that right? Here he comes, everybody. Can you see him? No, I'm just saying that to build anticipation. Yes, I can see him. He looks... Here he you see him there? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Debbie, this leopard's nose is exceptional. He's walking straight towards it now. I might be tempted to take my camera out. Very naughty, I know. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm so rebellious. waiting expectantly for the leopard to grab this kill. Will he? Won't he? Yes, he will. Oh, he's missing it. He's going, he's, he's going off behind. This way. Now he's creating jeopardy and suspense. It's over here. Here. Come on. It's just here. No, not there. Getting, cold now. Getting colder, 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 colder. Oh. Maybe his nose isn't so good. Maybe he's just on a random. That's it. That's it. Look right. Look right. Just here. Warmer. No, colder again. Come on. See, I've got my camera out and everything. He's looking the other way now. I don't want to move the car because then all he'll smell is the bowels of Rusty. This way. Mm -hmm. Come on. That's it. That's it. Yes. Turn your head. Yeah. A bit more. That's it. A bit more. A bit more. Come on. No. Colder again. You're only 30 meters away. Hmm. I'm sorry about this, everybody. Maybe we should just try and move. I can change the angle slightly. I don't want to get in his way because when he eventually looks this way. Ow, ow. Well, Elizabeth, you're absolutely right. There are too many vehicles. Well, they're not too many, but he's not only smelling diesel, he's now smelling petrol because that's what, um, he's just, li he's lying down. <laughs> Can you see him through there? 
this. All right, we're not going to move now. He can smell it, he just can't pick it up yet. And the reason he stopped is because the wind is now... That's very interesting. So the wind is coming from the direction he's looking. That's why he's looking into the wind and he can no longer smell it. So it's not to do with the cars. It's to do with the fact that he's he's no longer down, down <laughs> upwind of the kill. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I missed the name, but the <laughs> the thought that he has a cold is an interesting one. Mafuta, you think he might have a cold and therefore is not smelling properly. I think it's more a function of the wind. I don't think he's got a cold. That's hilarious. We're just letting Dylan go past. Dylan's going to watch from the other side. Now he's looking, looking back towards the, the kill, sort of. Come on, fellow. Get on with it. Yeah, he's looking this way. Not far now. He's watching a vulture coming in. Now he's lost the scent because the wind is now blowing in the wrong direction. I'm very pleased we were able to spend this time here. Grace, no, for a leopard, just about anything is edible. The most rotting, foul, rancid piece of meat that you wouldn't uh, feed to your worst enemy, a leopard will eat very comfortably. It might make a slightly smelly poo-poo afterwards, but it won't have any deleterious effects. They have very powerful acidic digestion. So he just made the mistake of taking a wrong turn in the wind and now he's got he's got too far into the wind for him to smell it if he sees it of course all he needs to do is take three steps forward and look right and then he'll see it but unfortunately his English is very poor and so he's unable to hear me say that well Tweety Kid yes so close yet so far let's hope for his sake Come on, Tingana. You know this area. Where do you think that smell could have come from? Think carefully now. The wind has into your face and you no longer smell it. Now, if you think carefully, that must therefore mean that you've either walked past it or you're in line with it and therefore no longer smelling. That's it. You are listening to me now. It is correct. Just stand up now. Come on. Come on. No. Oh, no. Lovely Laurie. I think hooking it to the back of the car and dragging him past it certainly would have the desired effect. I would do it. Except for the fact, of course, that unfortunately Seb would be unable to film it because the camera doesn't film behind us. Otherwise it would be an excellent plan. I am, of course, joking. For those of you who are now utterly scandalized, um, I, I would never do that. He will find this eventually. Look, he's smelling. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. Yes. Amber, you have to draw him a map. That's a very good idea. I should walk up there and draw him a little map. Or just draw an arrow on the road with a picture of a dead bushbuck next to it. Yes, he's smelling. Come on. Come on. Everyone's been parked, hopefully, that 
waiting to see if you'll come and pick it up. Now there's a car next to the carcass. Yes? Yes, come on. Let's blow towards him. Okay, Sheldon's going to go past. So that's why Seb is just lifting the camera up so that we don't see his guests and they haven't signed released forms which means that if they were to be seen on television they could probably sue us millions of dollars it's not true there's a vulture he's now looking towards the vulture oh no colder uh, he's going to get it now watch I have a feeling I have a feeling that shortly his olfactory senses are going to kick into overdrive. <sighs> I need to quickly talk on the radio before all of these fellows come from the north. Stations, I am on the Eastern Channel, and Tengana has crossed south into Chitwa. Like I say, I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be allowed to be here. I must just call in on the radio. Hmm? Well, sitting bull, yes, to a certain extent the vultures would guide him to the kill, but they're not sitting above the kill, you see. He will look around where they are, but he's not going towards... Them. They are not above the kill. So he's looking at them and thinking, what are you guys looking at? And uh, while, you know, I have the greatest respect for the intelligence of a leopard, he's not... I doubt he's looking at their eyes, thinking, you know, sort of trying to triangulate from there. He's picking something up on the wind. Oh, 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 yes, you see, he's getting the odd molecule of rotting bushbuck is reaching his nostrils and then... Then the wind blows it away. I think we must wait patiently here. I don't think we should move just yet. He's so close. Now the wind's blowing the wrong way. Now, Tengana, logically, if you can't smell it anymore, that's it. Can't smell it anymore, it means you've gone past it. Okay? Up and down, up and down this road. <laughs> Somebody is calling. Somebody's. <laughs> Somebody's calling in fresh tracks of the leopard crossing in here to us, but we have him. Which is very nice of them. Sorry, Kirsten, the game drive radio exploded in my ear again. Please, would you go again with that? <laughs> yes, Keir, I know exactly what you mean. Um, the <laughs> it, it does remind one of Mr. Bean trying to get down the stairs with all those old people in front of him. I remember that episode. It's deeply frustrating because you can see the conclusion of the story and yet he, the main subject of the story, refuses to see it for you or with you. Ooh, okay, this is good. I'm going to wait here because what he's going to do, he keeps down this path. He's going to pick it up again. Come south. Yes. No. No. hopeless effort from a cat that found the impala carcass the other night. Oh, no, he's gone to sleep. Oh. As uh, Kirsten says, great leopardy. She's trying to be very funny there. 
uh, using, of course, the word jeopardy instead of leopardy. Find out if there are any other stations here. Is there any station on standby for this Tingana sighting? Bushbuck's still there, hasn't moved. It's not very surprising. It's difficult to move with no internal organs and a missing front leg. Anyone on standby? Okay, we'll move out. We'll move out. Cool. Okay, everybody, there are lots of people waiting to come in and see him, so we're going to head out. See what else we can see, you know, we might be lucky. Maybe those doggies will pitch up again. We could also, of course, go back to Scuba Steve. I'm sure all of you are desperate to find out about Scuba Steve's love life and whether it is progressing. So we'll do that. We just need to get out of Chitwa now. We'll go around the other side. Uh, Lisa, the answer to that question is actually relatively easy to answer, I think. Uh, the ratio of male to female leopards is roughly three females to one male. It's probably slightly less than three, say 2.8 or odd, uh, somewhere around there. And so that means basically that every male leopard will have between two and three females in his territory, sometimes more than that. But in this area, in my experience, it's normally sort of three. Tingana's only got two at the moment, Tandi and her daughter Guchava, both of whom he has sired offspring with, which is nice. But those are the only ones in his territory at, at present. All right, I don't know where Steph is headed. I don't know if he's been to Bivolzuk Dam to check on Scuba's romance, but we are going to do that now. Whoa. That is amazing, James. How did you do that? That is almost clairvoyant. As we got here to Bivolzuk Dam, precisely to show you Scuba Steve and his girlfriend, you came across to us. Wow, that's actually quite astounding, to be honest with you. So there you have Biffles Hook Dam in all its glory. <laughs> and uh, as always, Scuba Steve is practicing his uh, breathing techniques for whatever reason. His girlfriend just resting either on his back or on a sandbank that's there. I'm very glad that he's managed to keep her. So far, so good then for him. There's actually quite a lot of water here. Look, it's very shallow at the moment, and I think the evaporation rate of the wind and the, the warm daytime temperatures are not going to help this dam stay full for very long. However, it would be interesting to know how far under this dam's level, uh, if, if even, the water table is. Because that's actually what keeps these dams and these river courses full, is the water table. And I'm not convinced that uh, the little bit of rain that we had this year was enough to fill the, the water table sufficiently. And I think that this is just runoff, held in here by clay on the bottom, and not really fed by anything. And we will see over the coming months, how quickly it dries up. I'm expecting this to dry up end of August and then when the really hot months come, September, October, those killer months that we have over here before the rains really come and see how much water is left. I came to you just ask a question about tortoises and what tortoises we see and, and what kinds we have. 
Hi Kent, we see quite a few tortoises here. We've got the Speaks hinged back tortoise and the leopard tortoise are the terrestrial tortoises. And then we've got the Speaks hinged back terrapin uh, and the marsh terrapin. So those are the those are the uh, the aquatic uh, terrapins that we have or freshwater turtles. Um, so we have four different kinds here um, and they are fairly common during the summer months when the activity periods are much longer and also where uh, where where it's where it's warmer for for longer periods of the day that being said last year myself and herbie found a ester or hibernating uh hingeback tortoise and they and it, this particular tortoise was lying up in the uh in a termite mound for months for the coldest time of the earth, so July, August, I think he came out in September, I can't really remember. We actually found, we were there one day and then the next week he was, he was already missing. Um, so the app, they really do hibernate. They, they fill up a, uh, a sack of water in their bodies called a bursa and they live off fat deposits that they deposit on their body uh, throughout the summer. And so don't need to come out much. But I don't think that all tortoises here, or all uh, all tortoises, this is the terrestrial tortoises hibernate. I do think that there are some individuals that don't. And the reason why I say that is because I saw a honey badger tackle a leopard tortoise just a week ago. And I think that the bigger tortoises would definitely, the leopard tortoises are definitely not hibernating. They're just, their the activity periods are, are slightly shorter. Um, the terrapins, of course, they don't hibernate at all. They live off of insects, and although not many, there are still a lot of insects active below the waterline, and they will pick off even ticks uh, on buffalo, and so they don't hibernate at all. In actual fact, I'm trying to find you one even now. The best place to look is in the sun on the water's edge. And possibly hmm, in the shallows. Let's see. Maybe let's go and look there. Yeah, that's a good place to look. Try and go the other way if we can uh, into the shallows here next to that stump. Let's see if we can see one. They're quite shy. And usually at the first sign of a vehicle or of a person, they dive back under the water. No, there's none there. Not today. But you keep on watching, we definitely will show you them. They're very common out here, in actual fact. It's nice reflections this afternoon. The wind has died down to a slight puff out of, uh, out of the east. And there you can see the clouds reflected beautifully in the Buffalzook Dam. That is nice. This is a nice picture. Right, let's go and see what James is going to get up to now. I'm driving up the eastern boundary at the moment. I'm very disappointed because Steph has gone to see Scuba Steve. So I'm not sure that I should go and see Scuba Steve anymore. Not sure what else I'm going to do. Oh. Apparently we do need to do a little bit of soap opera narration, so I might pop up there as well, just before dark. It's beastly cold still, but at least the sun has come out. There, Sebastian, is our favourite bird, you and I. Do you see about two-thirds of the way up that main trunk, there is some movement. It is the wood pekar. And that's it, you're in the right spot. Now, I think it is the Cardinal Wood Picard again. And this, yeah, he's in there somewhere. Uh, he's just gone the other side. There, 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 there. He's gone, hasn't he? No, he's gone. I saw him fly. Yeah. I think it was actually bearded. I'm going to play the calls. I heard her call, or him, whatever it was. Just keep looking there. Maybe he'll come back. Wood Peck. Uh, search. Woodpecker Cardinal, let's have the sound. 
Yeah, you see, it wasn't that. I think let us play the biarded. It is a biarded woodpecker, everybody. A biarded woodpecker. I can also hear a great deal of off-road driving in the near... Shut up now, you have a horrible voice. There's a vehicle driving off-road in the near vicinity at a great speed. You hear that? Yeah. Either they're clearing a path for a new road or they're on the chase of something. Let's keep going a little bit forward. There they come. What do those people have over there? Stations off-road on Torchwood heading towards Cheetah Cut Line. I don't know what they've got. They've got something. I'm going with Leopard about to climb on that termite mound. Maybe they're just after the bearded woodpecker. That would be interesting. Kirsten thinks they're after the bearded woodpecker. Kirsten has, of course, lost her mind. I'm damnably sure that a leopard is going to climb onto that termite mound. Rexon and Genomoyed. Milanza in it. Oh, copy. They're following a honey badger. I think the chances of us seeing a honey badger. Apparently it's quite relaxed. It's coming onto the termite mound, he says. There, 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 there. The front of the termite mound? I think, yeah, I bet it's... Yeah. Fantastic. That is magic. He's coming towards you, Rex. You still got him. Uh, no, no. Yeah, 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 I do, I do. Yeah, he's right around the front. Have you see, can you see him? This is an amazing honey badger sighting, everybody. That's really fantastic. Let's just wait here. I think he went off down there, isn't oh, he? Is. Oh, here he's coming straight towards yeah. us. Straight towards us. He's in full charge, says Kirsten. I wonder if I would think I'll get a picture of him. Never had a picture of a honey badger before. Unfortunately, my camera is so slow at focusing. Come on, man. This is wonderful. Not one photograph. Oh, that was very angry of him. He got very cross with us. <laughs> that was amazing. You still got him. <laughs> that was great. I didn't get a picture of him because I'm so slow. That was very, very cool. For those of you who are perhaps new viewers, that is called a honey badger and that is one of the rarest animals to see out here. We know they're around, we see their tracks very often and we just don't see them very often. Oh, that's very special. All righty, shall we continue? Very cool. Hello, everybody. Hello, yours. I'm Carmen, you say OMG. Did you, is that what you said? Goodness gracious, Carmen, yes, but I agree with you, OMG. Oh, those big teeth, yes, very big teeth. You saw them hi him hissing at uh, Sebastian. He wasn't hissing at me, he wouldn't have dared hiss at me. Sebastian, he took offence. I'm not sure why. 
doesn't like French people. Kirsten says he's smiling for the camera, rather. I suppose that's possible. <laughs> that is so cool. Nikki says James is on fire. No, James is not on fire at all. That is blind luck that we happened to arrive at the same time Rex and Yours were following. That was just great. Fantastic stuff. Alrighty. We'll head up towards Beefle's waterhole now. And we'll tell Steve all about our honey badger sighting and see what he has to say. See if something of that magnitude manages to garner some sort of enthusiasm. Some people having their drinks over there. One of them, I think, was behind the termite mound for some privacy. Mm -hmm. Joy, both Ralph and Steve will be upset by that sighting. I hope that they will revel in the fact that I got to see the animal that they love so dearly. The honey badger is definitely Ralph's spirit animal. I think. I mean, if one can have a definite spirit animal, I'm not sure if that's possible. Good. That was really nice. Let me tell you a little bit about a honey badger, for those of you who don't know. Um, they are immensely intelligent. They are known to be able, for example, to work out puzzles. I mean, you can go and look up, you can go and watch a video of a captive uh, honey badger called, what was his name? Uh, Vessel or, no. No, his name was Vessel or Fossil or Quibus or, um, what was it? Oh, come on, then. Stoffel. There we go. Stoffel the honey badger. Stoffel the honey badger. Just go and YouTube that, and you will find amazing footage of this honey badger working out how to escape an enclosure. Using tools, you'll find footage of them, not in that one, catching kingfishers. They, they can see kingfisher nests. They reach up. They realize they can't reach them. They'll go and fetch a log, put them underneath climb onto the log, try and reach the kingfisher, still can't get up there. Go and fetch another log, put it on top of the first log, climb up and fetch the kingfishers out. So they're immensely intelligent. Problem solvers. Uh, they are vicious. You don't want to be catched by one. If you get in one's way, the first place it will try and bite, if you happen to be a man, is uh, your scrotum. And, um, I mean, I've gone cold just thinking about that thing attacking me in that particularly sensitive area. So you don't want to be attacked by one. I have seen this footage of them chasing off lions. You'll find footage of them standing down, you know, three or four lions at a time and eventually being left alone. They make a foul stink. They are part of the same family as the skunks belong to, so they make a disgusting stink. And they will basically, they're carnivores, they'll basically eat anything that they can catch. And they will eat honey and bee larvae. They'll eat bee larvae and honey. That's why they're called honey badgers. Yes, Ellie, at age seven, they absolutely do eat honey. They don't seem to mind the bee stings at all, so they will raid a nest. The big story, of course, is that they are led to honey uh, to honey nests, to bees, <laughs> to bee hives, by honey guides, which are birds that find hives, and then they'll find either a human being or a honey badger, and they'll come and make a noise, a very specific noise, which indicates that they found the hive, and they'll then lead the human being or the badger towards the hive, and then when they find the hive, the badger will use its claws to open it up, human beings would use whatever else they use to open up the hive, and while the honey guide eats the larvae of the bees, and the bees themselves, the honey guide, at least the honey badger, enjoys the honeycomb and the sweetness of the honey. And the legend, of course, is that if you do not feed the honey guide after it has led you to a beehive, then it, next time it will lead you to a predator or a snake. Steph has actually followed one of those birds too. 
a beehive. How cool is that sighting that you just had? I'm very envious and very happy for you in actual fact. Uh, it's not very common that we see them at all. I mean, I'm sure James told you about that. But yes, we have followed a honey guide to a honey a be a beehive. It took us about, I can't remember, about 40 minutes or so. The bird, the honey guide chittered and came and called us um, and basically led us on a on a 200 meter or so gap. It did call from about 200 meters away. We'd catch up and fly away, come back. And eventually was chittering at the entrance to a tree. and. Um, and showed us where the beehive was but um, as Kirsty just pointed out right now we didn't leave it any honey we didn't break it open and so after a little bit of time it realized that all that effort was for uh, for nothing and flew away which was um, unfortunate because as tradition has it if you don't leave the bird anything or it's a waste of effort the next time that bird finds you in the bush and calls to you and you follow it it leads you to a man-eating lion or a poisonous snake um, so I haven't followed a honey guide since then, just in case I get eaten by something or bitten. So, uh, but that's, uh, it, it really is true and it really has a, a symbiosis with, with, uh, with people. And um, so there's a, there's two forktail drongos sitting there. You can see the one. And what caught my eye was what they were sitting there for, and if you look closely, you'll see why. Now those mongoose are, I don't know what they're doing, it looks like there's a termite mound there, or they're still foraging, and the drongos realize that the, the mongoose will kick up insects as they're foraging, especially insects that fly, and will then they'll catch their dinner that way and that's another type of symbiosis so not only do the honey guard and the honey badger have a symbiotic relationship and the honey guard and people have a symbiotic relationship but the drongo and the mongoose have a symbiotic relationship as well and we can say that it's probably commensalism which is where one party benefits and the other party is neither harmed nor benefits from the relationship. So that is the subclass of symbiosis that we're having a look at over there. The drongo gets some insects from the foraging behavior of the mongoose. The mongoose are neither harmed nor, uh, nor, are they, nor do they benefit from it. I suppose in a way it could be, could be mutualism because the drongo, while close to the mongoose, if there's a leopard around, will make an alarm call. And so it could change, I suppose, depending on the, depending on the conditions. It definitely looks like a termite mound there. It's a bit late now for these guys to be foraging with the, without having a home close by. So it's just the last little bit of suntan and grooming before they disappear into their mound for the evening. I must say, watching these guys never ever gets old. I'm just listening, excuse me going quiet there for a bit, but I was just listening to some alarm calls. Sinak, you've asked a nice question. Do drongos help mongoose fend off predators? Um, in other words, would the drongo help to mob a predator that was uh, potentially trying to eat the mongoose? Um, Sinak, I'm going to say no to that. Um, Although that being said, I'm, and why do I want to say no? I want to say no because mongoose won't help mob owls and drongos, generally speaking, mob owls. Mongoose mob snakes um, and the snakes that will be a danger to the mongoose are snakes that are on the ground, not snakes that are in the tree or in a tree. 
And drongos will only mob snakes in trees. They don't mob snakes on the ground. And so that's why I want to say no to you. But it is a grey one, that CNAC. I must be honest with you. I think there's a good chance that potentially the drongo will show the mongoose where the snake is and then the mongoose will come in. And you might find the mongoose might do a little bit of these cursory mobs, but definitely the mob that we're talking about is when they fly actively at, uh, at an owl or at a snake trying to knock it out of a tree or create a disturbance that it flies away. So, no in my experience, you know, but a good question in any case. I must be honest, this has to be one of my most favorite roads. There's always something going, uh, going on on this road, and although it's nice and straight and fairly boring for a bit, it, uh, it just always has a good feeling about it. It has this energy. And let's find a nice place to have a look at the sunset. David, what do you think? Hmm. Let's see what we've got. Ah. Jandre is passing comment from the final control room. And so he's made his way back from the Grand Caymans via the Mara, via Cape Town. And so welcome back, Jandre. It's all good to have you back this side. That is a nice picture. There you go. David the artist is setting up the most fantastic scenic shots. For those of you in the world about to enter into into the morning, um, take a screenshot and have that as your picture for the day. Remind you of all the good things still to come. Very nice. Now this time of the day also gives us a chance to listen to the bush and one of the reasons why we stop and look at all the small things is that it's only really then that you can pick up sounds of uh, animals giving alarm calls for whatever reason. What is that in the top of the tree there, David? Sorry. Are those vivid monkeys? In the top of that, uh, that tree there. Yeah. There. there we go. Some vivid monkeys also just catching the last rays of the sun. Shame, right? They, they must get absolutely freezing because they have to roost in trees, unlike gorillas and orangutans that do not build nests out of leaves. They don't sleep in cavities, they just rest on the branches next to the trunks. <laughs> I do feel sorry for them. Man. They always look so like dejected. But that's exactly what we're talking about. So these monkeys now catching the last rays of the sun have an elevated position over the bush. And if there was a predator here, leopard, cheetah, lion, uh, even caracal, serval, big snake, crowned eagle, they would all give an alarm call and call us in. And one of the ways that we use the signs of the bush here to find you, the animal characters that we all like looking at. I wonder where the rest of the family is. I should say troop, that is the correct collective name for... Uh, for a group of monkey and this is the only monkey species that we find here at Maripskop which is the closest uh, other game reserve than the Kruger National Park to where we are we sometimes see it as part of the Drakensberg range they have some mango monkey which look almost the same as this just a slight color variation and, and uh, restricted to very dense evergreen forest um, and then they also have the other two nocturnal primates as well. Now, somehow we don't get gorillas here where we are right now. Gorillas are restricted to equatorial Africa and a few degrees off of the equator. Um, Uganda, Rwanda, um, the DRC, both portions of the DRC, and where else do we find gorillas? Um, that's about it as far as I can remember. But equatorial Africa, so uh, roughly uh, 
4,000 kilometers north of where we are now lies the equator, and that's where we find the great apes, chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, and orangutans are found in Indonesia, so not on the African continent. Um, the biggest monkeys that we have here, or the biggest apes that we have here, are baboons. Uh, the Chakma baboon um, gets to, I think, about 50 kilograms, if I'm not mistaken. Um, gets to about 50 kilograms for the maximum weight. Uh, and that's the, the biggest and the only large primate that we find here. Um, other than the vervid monkey, those are the two daytime primates. In nighttime primates, we have the lesser and the greater galagos, or greater bush babies. Um, and that's the sum total of the primates, uh, you know, other than James and myself from time to time. <laughs> Talking about a singing primate, why don't we go and have a look at James and see if he's managed to find us or what his plans are for finding us in Ardfar. Well, I'm not going to find an Ardfar, I don't think. Um, we might be lucky, somebody else might find an Ardfar and we might be close by when they do, in which case we will see it. Sebastian, does it feel to you like that camera is staring down at me more than the other one does? I feel like that's about the same angle as it is in Jigger. Is that better? Shall I drive like that? We're in Rusty today. You're chopping my head off. No, don't do that. I am, of course, not sitting on two blankets anymore because it's too cold, and so I need the one blankie for my leggies. Maybe we'll be very lucky and have those two wild dogs at Biffelsook waterhole. That would be very nice indeed. Now tomorrow, don't forget, of course, that... Yeah, you're also talking about the honey badgers, which is good. Uh, tomorrow, remember, Baron is joining us, as long as he can get his rickety old land over here on time for the afternoon drive. So Baron and I will no doubt be trading insults. Byron Schmechter Sorau will be <laughs> arriving and we will trade insults with each other for most of the afternoon. <laughs> it's time I told you the Schmechter story, I think. <laughs> Schmechter seems <laughs> is some sort of over-the-counter medicine that is used for stomach upset. So if you've got a runny tummy, you apparently take Schmechter. But for, for many months, it seemed that it was the only thing anyone was ordering from the Putzbrey Township was sort of boxes and boxes of Schmechter. So <laughs> <laughs> you looked in the first aid kit, and that's all you could find was, was Schmechter. You couldn't find a band-aid to put on a cut. You couldn't find a safety pin to tie on a bandage. You couldn't find a burn shield to put on a little burn. You couldn't find some disinfectant to put on a tick bite. All you could find was Schmechter, and you had to apply it to whatever you needed. So, I mean, if you had, say, a an infected saw. You had to take the schmecter, mix it into a paste and put it on you. I'm kidding you about that. You didn't really have to do that. But there was a lot of schmecter around and Byron came out of his room one day looking slightly green about the gills and decreed for the first time in the camp's history since we'd been buying schmecter by the ton that he, Byron Sirau, had a runny tummy and would now use the first box of schmecter. And so, so he did, and ever since then he has been known as Byron Schmechter Sorau. He doesn't take it regularly, it was just a very brief incident in his life, but that's why we call him Schmechter if you are wondering. There's a gorgeous sunset about to happen. <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny. <laughs> Kirsten says she thinks we need to bring it back for his time here. I think she means uh, calling him Schmechter as opposed to uh, buying tons of Schmechter and populating every first aid kit in the camp with the stuff. It's very funny. 
<laughs> I'm not sure why such things are so funny, but they are. There's something about the word schmechter that is, <laughs> that is inevitably amusing. Some words are just funny. Uh, also, nice alliteration with his surname, yes. But the word schmechter is <laughs> it's just a funny word. Can you think of any funny words, Sebastian? Words that make you laugh just on saying them? No. Sebastian says no, no words are funny. Um, <laughs> trying to think of another one. <laughs> huh? Bubble. Bubble. Yes, bubble. Bubble. And of course, to hear Sebastian say squirrel is very funny, isn't it, Sebastian? Squirrel. 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 <laughs> and you must get Steph to say monitor. How does he say it, Kirsten? Oh, Seb, say monitor, 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 monitor. But Sebastian can say anything, and people will melt at his feet. Yes. Spaghetti is sweet history is quite a funny word. Yes, spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steffi, the word dick dick, um, of course, is uh, not a rude word. It describes a dwarf antelope, but that is quite a funny word. I must, I must admit, dick dick, yes. It's quite a good one. That <laughs> schmecter tops them all, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, petty palps, that's a good one, Crystal. Petty palps. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of rude words that are very funny, but we won't repeat any of those. We would have played a game yesterday um, called, what's it called? Put it in the hat, or take it out of the hat, or in the hat, or word in the hat, or whatever it is. And basically, everybody writes three words on a piece of paper, puts it in the hat, and in round one, you have to try and describe what's on the, you shake them all up in the hat, have two teams, and you hand the hat around and everybody takes out, basically takes out one of the pieces of paper and has to describe to their team what it is without saying the word. That's the first round. Second round, all the same words go back into the hat. There are some nyalas. I'm going to carry on because I think we're going to get a really nice view of the sky from Bufflesook Dam. Uh, second round, you put them all back in the hat and then you have to act out all the same clues in your teams. And the third round is you can make one sound, only one sound, and your team has to guess what the clues are. But of course, because you've done them twice, you can guess pretty much what they're going to be. Anyway, obviously everybody, or a lot of people, put naughty words into these clues, and so it becomes very hilarious indeed, and Schmechter would be a perfect one. Kirsten says, only the boys put dirty words in. I don't think that's true. But Schmechter will be perfect for the next one. I must try and remember it. So if you were acting it out, for example, and you had got Schmechter, you would just point to Byron, and everyone would go, oh yes, Schmechter. <laughs> ah, here we go. Today's episode of the life and times of Scuba Steve. Let's have a quick look at that gorgeous sky. We do actually, we need to have a little theme song before we arrive at Buffalsook Dam. Something cheesy played on a soprano saxophone. The inimitable Kenny G. Kirsten thinks it should be like the bold and the beautiful, but I don't think that that's true because I, well, Steve may be many things, but a fashionista he is not. I'm embarrassed that I know that. Anyway, let's go forward slightly once you're done there with the sun, Sebastian. Very nice clouds. Got you a little bit late for the sun to actually go down. And uh, let's discover what Steve has to show us today. Hmm. 
Okay. Look, he moved. Good evening, Steve. How are you? Sarah, nice to see you two again. On your fourth date, I see. Fantastic. I see that you are lying quite close to each other. Now, what we have here is a very interesting development in the relationship, because while Steve is in his inevitable pose, uh, she is resting on his back. You can see that they are now moved on to the realm of public displays of affection. That's what we have going here now. You can see that she is resting on his rump, and in fact, uh, closing her eyes, she is so relaxed. Look at that. Oh, that's wonderful to see. They've become extremely comfortable with each other in the four dates that they have been around each other. Very, very nice. Yes, closing her eyes and her nose at the same time. She is giving him side eye, that is correct, Kirsten, but that's because he's to her side. So yesterday they had a bit of an argument because he refused to go and see what the Franklins were alarming about, but obviously they've got over that, and now they're resting peacefully as the sun goes down, enjoying the sunset. Scuba, of course, is immobile, as usual. Says nothing, does nothing. Yes, Dory, uh, his lady friend's name is Sarah. Yes, she is. Scuba Sarah. Well, she's not scuba yet. I don't think they've got married in four days. They're still courting, but certainly she seems very comfortable in his space. One just worries slightly that, you know, a big bull hippo like this spent a lot of time on his own as a bachelor. One worries that his habits will be difficult to break. You know, I don't know where he leaves his washing. Perhaps he leaves it on the floor. Is he prepared to uh, share his bed? Uh, I don't know. I mean, is he prepared to share his favorite grazing grounds? Does he have a particular routine that he follows every evening that she doesn't particularly like? And maybe she will suggest a new routine, which uh, will put him out slightly. I mean, a stubborn fellow like Steve, that could easily happen. You know, we're going to go up go eat our grass now, Sarah. Why don't we go around this way? Let's go around to the western side of the dam this time. I saw some grass. I don't like going down the western side. I did it once. I don't like it. I like to go east. You know I'd like to go east. Go 100 metres east, 100 metres north, 100 metres west, and then 100 metres back to the water, have a drink, and repeat the same process a few times. You know that. But, Steve, we don't always have to do the same thing, do we? Can't we Can't we just vary it up a bit? I mean, I, I think we might find some different kinds of grasses. I don't like different kinds of grasses. I've got my way of doing things. That's why I live here, on my own, in Bifthorpe Dam. But you don't live on your own anymore, Steve, do you? Well, I mean, I sort of do. I... But I live here now, Steve. Do you? Did you move in? I thought you were just staying over for a little while. No, I've, I've moved in. I told, I told Matilda and Alice that I, I was going to come and live here with you. Oh, well, it's quite soon. Um, well, um, well, I don't really know what to say at this stage, so I think I'll just have a think for a while. So you see, these are the things that happen in... Uh, Bottomless life. See, Scuba needs to get over the fact that he is a bachelor, because if he wants company, he's going to have to make sacrifices. All men have to learn that, and the older we get, of course, the more apparent it becomes to us. You don't have to wear the same clothes each on particular days of the week. <laughs> Raj, you say, are oh, you on the wrong channel? No, you're not, Raj. It's just that um, I've taken to teasing poor old Scuba and Sarah on a daily basis now. It's OK. Soon other people will be driving and they won't do the same thing. Let's have one last look also at the dreadful parents that are back resident here. I'll move slightly for you, Sid. Try not to drive off the wall. 
There we have the Egyptian gooses. Poor things. Let us hope that Steve and Sarah win. Should their, should their um, dating turn into a marriage and that marriage be consummated and um, be blessed with a small hippopotamus, let us hope that they show slightly better parenting skills than these two. You've managed to lose, I think, just about every clutch they've ever produced. They'll be looking quite interestingly, I think. Look at them digging in the mud there. What I think they're probably trying to release is algae. So they are totally vegetarian, except for these two. In fact, exactly these two who I've seen eating fish. There is no record before the one that we have, no official record before the one that we have of Egyptian geese eating fish. I've no doubt they have before, but these two eat fish. But that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for snails or mollusks, other mollusks or any invertebrates or anything like that. They'll be looking for some sort of water vegetation in the mud there. And I don't know what that would be. See how they're digging? That's fascinating. Just going to open me bird up quickly while you look at them and just make sure that I haven't made some kind of mistake about what it is that they eat. I haven't about the vegetation, but they they may eat a, a greater sweet of vegetation than I'm giving them credit for. Goose Egyptian. Food, mainly vegetable matter, especially grass shoots, rhizomes and tubers. Well, they're not eating any of those things there. Let's go down to the larger description. Dabbles, probes in the water, perches on and follows hippopotamuses. Ah, they may well be going for hippopotamuses dung, something like that. I'm going to do a little bit more investigation. Let's go across to uh, Stefan, who I believe has got a predator. We definitely do, and my favorite predator of all is a spotted hyena. And we've got two of them just lying down. I'm convinced that these are the two that were at the uh, the Juma Dam or Voyatella Dam uh, camera early this morning. At around about 6.30 or so, we tracked these two into this area. <clears throat> that noise that you're busy hearing there is a bird called the green wood hoopoe. And it's a family of them that are just having a bit of a territorial spat with their neighbors. Let's see if we can see them, actually. We'll come back to these hyena. Sorry, David. Right there in the top of that tree there. Le right, sorry, right. Down. Is that the tree? Let's see if we can see them do it again. Come right again. So, uh, maybe. No. Did they fly away? <laughs> I didn't see anything. <laughs> Uh, they flew away while we were trying to find them. That's okay. We'll carry on. At least we got something else to. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> At least we got uh, some ahina left, which aren't going anywhere. <clears throat> so I think that these ahina have been in this area, probably tailing Tingana, to be honest with you, but have reached the ed edge of where they can go, where their territory stretches, and they've just been lying up here now, waiting for him to come back. Um, and I just love these guys. They're always busy doing something. They've got a bit of a mischievous look to them. Um, and really, they are so much more entertaining to watch than what, uh, what most things are now. But of course, now, because I wanted to say that they're going to sleep for most of the time. Have a look at the folds that he's got between his ears, or she's got between her ears. Very difficult to sex while they're lying down on the floor. Virtually impossible. Definitely not something that I could do. Jamie could possibly be able to do it already. She's got such an, a fantastic knowledge of hyena um, from both here and her time spent up at the Mara. She could probably sex them. I'm just judging it based on size. And uh, these look like females, although who knows? Of the hyena species that we get, this is the spotted hyena. And you do get brown hyena in this area, although very rare. And then as, f as soon as you go a little bit north, 
of here you get uh, you get striped hyena as well. And then other members of the family is a is a hyena, termite eating hyena called an art wolf, an earth wolf or art wolf. They also exist here, but also again quite rare and, and more common outside of the game reserves where spotted hyena, lion and leopard absolutely dominate them and uh, and displace them in fact. Spotted hyena, very similar to lions, are what's called a super predator. And depending on uh, numbers in any given area, hyena will either be more dominant than lion or lion more dominant than hyena. In this particular area, the hyena clans are, are relatively fragmented and very rarely do they come together uh, in any large numbers. And so lion tend to be the dominant predator. There we go, look at the teeth. Oh, very close. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Big stretch. Thick neck. Now their skull, uh, looking at it face on, so from the nose back towards the skull, is actually a triangle, a very sharply angled triangle. The roundness that you see there is from muscles. Uh, those chewing muscles attach to their sagittal crests and are about as thick as your bald fist. So bald, there we go. Wow. I hope some of you are quick on the button, got, uh, got some proper screenshots of those. You'll see their teeth are just unbelievably overdeveloped and massive. So unlike the sharp cutting edges of a leopard or a lion that have to shear through flesh uh, and have pretty well maintained edges, uh, hyena's teeth tend to be robust and thick. And although do possess cutting edges, are not nearly as well developed as those of lions. And it's because they are more all-round eater. Hyena will not only... There we go, another one. Good, well done. They may yawn again, so get ready. Um, hyena are not only capable of tearing up their own prey, but they also feed a lot on carrion um, and utilize a lot more of the carcass than what a lion could, for instance. So large bones, hyena can crack open and, um, and dismember, whereas lions can't always get to the thicker bones and the bone marrow inside. And that makes hyena a lot more adaptable and a lot more widespread, funnily enough. Lion currently are going through a bit of a crisis. Another yawn. Good stuff. They're starting to get active now and will start their patrols. Not uncommon to find two hyena together. Now, Robin, you say that those are some serious teeth. I must, I must agree with you. They have got a properly impressive set of teeth. Uh, sun's down, stretching, time to go. These guys don't waste any time, I must be honest with you. Hyena are not ones to mess about. Now, with them standing up, let's see what they're going to do. Hello there. What's going on, bud? Very good condition, this hyena. Just a few nips in the butt. I still can't sex these things from, uh, from next to us. They are in good condition, though. A few bites on the rump, and that's just from them generally just being what they are. Ooh. My seat just broke. Now, Trish, you say that you just want to pet them, but you must resist. I must agree with you, although there's this mad filmmaker called, um, what is he called? Uh, Kim Voliter that managed to get himself involved in a clan of Ahina and he could actually sit down next to these Ahina and uh, and get close enough for them to interact with him and I bought the documentary that detailed this particular clan and, and his adventures with them and I must be honest with you where I expected these Ahina to tear him to pieces they adopted him into the family and he became part of this wild clan of Ahina and you know, lots of controversy around it, of course, and, you know, we don't really want to get into a debate on the right or the wrong of it. He took a chance and he did what he thought he needed to do. And against the odds, um, they actually, it worked. He became part of this family and uh, could hunt with them on foot, you know. And uh, 
really amazing. Now these two clan members, you might find that they are on the edge of their clan territory where they feel comfortable and now they're going to move back. They're moving back in the direction they came from if it's the same two individuals that we tracked into this area from Voyatella Dam this morning. Um, what, might, what might be interesting if, if uh, there were a couple of screenshots taken of the Ahina this morning, they have got spot patterns that are recognizable specifically on their left and right flanks and their faces. Um, I'm not good enough to recognize uh, them from their spot patterns. I never really have been uh, good, not with leopard, not with hyena. Um, but if any of you out there know if these hyenas are from the clan that we, we, we were watching on Juma a couple of months back, the clan that dens on, uh, on Aubrey's Road or, or on Mvubu Road, let us know if these are from that clan. Uh, it'll be nice to know that they're doing well. They look healthy, they look robust, and no fresh scars on them, which means that they've had a pretty good summer. And, uh, and we'll go into this dry time where they're actually just going to pick up uh, conditions. So it'll be nice to see. Ah, awesome. So Crystal, you've just, uh, you've just uh, Crystal, one of our viewers, has just ID'd them as June and Corky, which are two females from the clan that we know of here at Juma. So thank you, Crystal. That was awesome. Very quick on the, on the go there. Um, so there we go. So from the, from the clan that, that, that whose territory we know stretches from Simbambili into the southern Manuleti and then definitely onto Juma, uh, two females. So we've now got their sexes and they're called June and they're called, uh, um, I can't remember what the other one's called. Um, Oh, Corky. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> this, this airhead that I have at the moment. Things come in and blow straight out again, you know, um, which is quite nice. Thank you, Crystal. It's uh, much, much appreciated. Now, the reason why we're not following those Ahina is because there's a safari vehicle having a sundown or snack in that direction. And I don't want to go and disturb them. What we'll do is try and pick up them on the other side. Sweet history, you th you've heard somewhere that hyena can chew through metal. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story because I actually want to say that that's, that is uh, it, true to an extent. So no, their teeth are not harder than a piece of steel and so they can't bite through a piece of steel. But I once had a, I was in charge of a fleet of cars at uh, Sabi Sabi and we used to have dinners in the bush quite often and the leftover food scraps used to be uh, put into a dustbin and that dustbin was loaded onto a vehicle and a hyena can realize that when there was some noise coming from this area if they were brave enough they could steal this dustbin and then they would have enough food to feed them for the evening and so they became very bold and very uh, um, uh, very clever at coming up with ways to steal this dustbin and we thought we were clever by keeping the dustbin on the back of the car but one of the chefs must have touched the door of this car with a greasy hand. And this hyena got so excited at getting this dustbin off of this car that it bit an entire Land Rover door off of this vehicle and flung it to the side and then proceeded to eat the whole car. It ate the steering wheel, it ate the seat, it ate basically anything that it could do to get to this dustbin. It couldn't pull the dustbin closer to it. but. So yes, my experience is such that this hyena pulled a steel door with a steel hinge and a steel bolt tying it to the, the car off of this vehicle. And so in my experience, yes, they can't bite, they can't bite through steel, but they can bite into soft aluminium and definitely are strong enough to smash through a car. And as Kirsty quite rightly says, definitely like velociraptors. Whatever that's supposed to mean, Kirsty. <laughs> All right. Now, <clears throat> we're just going to wait for... We're not going to go and disturb those, um, those guests having a nice sundowner there. Hyena are smart enough to realize that if they sniff around sundowner spots, quite often they can pick up discarded uh, chicken wings and maybe a spilt uh, some, you know, some nuts on the floor. Um, even though you're very careful not to do that, sometimes, you know, the packet opens too vigorously and you can't pick, it, pick up anything or pick up everything. But what we'll do is we'll make a loop around and see if we can pick up uh, Dune and Corky on the other side of that. And um, why don't we go through to James Henry and see where he's headed next while I do just that. Well, 
Well, we're heading down towards the valley of the great Umalawamati, uh, hoping to bump into a leopard, perhaps. But we haven't had any sign or sound from any leopards. Speaking of which, why don't we stop and have a listen? Right, be quiet, everyone. Shh. It's lucky we stopped here to listen, because only through the bringing of my exceptional hearing to bear did I notice the two giraffe sitting not, ooh, I'd say, what, maybe ten metres from us. <laughs> Hello. Hello, ladies. How are you? Oh, no, there are three. There are lots of them. Now, we've been seeing these kind of old males most of the time, and now we've got some ladies. Honey badgers and giraffes, yes, we truly are spoilt this afternoon. No, that's not a lady, that's a young bull. In fact, they're both bulls. Just much younger ones than we've seen before in the last few days. I know it's a bull, of course, for those of you who are new viewers, because it has got bald horns. Well, Athena, goddess, wife of... Uh, who was Athena, wife of Apollo? I don't remember. Forget what I said there. Um, the, they have horns for fighting. Same reason that many animals have horns. And they use them to bash against each other. So they're not used for fighting of predators, they're used for fighting each other. And that's why they go bald. He's got some very bald horns, he's got the same problem as I do. But these are much younger than the ones we've been seeing. We've been seeing two really old fellows around of late. These guys are young, you can see, of course, they're smaller. And their coats are in better condition. And yes, they are lighter, but as I said yesterday, they do go darker and darker as they get older, but they all start off with a slightly different darkness. So the darkness of the coat is not necessarily a good way to age them. Well, they're eating Zizifus. Not then they're not. They're eating Balanites, the green thorn. You can see completely comfortable with all the spikies. Apparently Athena was single. I'm sorry about that, everybody. My mythology is, is dreadful. I don't know anything about mythology. It's not very important for this job, but I suppose if you're going to reference it, you better know what you're talking about. Hmm. So the green thorn obviously blessed with enormously spiky, nasty spines which don't seem to make one jot of difference to these giraffe. And I suspect actually that the spines and the branches themselves are quite nutritious because they are green and therefore they have chlorophyll in them, they're not purely wood. Isn't that amazing? Imagine wrapping your tongue around that lot. Which would be absolutely terrifying. I don't think happiness is going to make us do that this evening. I'm sure she will cook something without thorns in it. And there's a little bit of dusk chorus this evening. Much more Franklin sound that I'm than I've heard for a while. couple of drongos pretending to be owls, a few starlings, oh, it's quite a lot more lively than I've heard it for the last little while.
Christine, no, not normally. I mean, it depends what you mean by the word breed. Now, I don't know what the exact definition of the word breed is. There are certainly the species don't overlap. So here we've got giraffa, giraffa, the southern giraffe. No, did you hear a hyena? Oh, yes, very nice. Hyena's calling. Where is Steph? They might be his hyenas. Hmm. Anyway, so normally, the, I mean, almost always, the species of giraffe, the different species of giraffe, now that's exactly where they, they're calling from. They're calling from where Steph is. Normally, they are not found in overlapping ranges. But, you know, I, when you say breed, of course it brings to mind that there might be slight variations within the same species. Now, I just quickly want to go again to tell you exactly which species they are. So the three species are the Maasai giraffe, Giraffa tipple which we find there in Kenya, Giraffa reticulata, which we find in Kenya and Somalia, northern Kenya and Somalia, and then the southern giraffe. And this one has two subspecies. One, this particular one, which has the name Giraffa, Giraffa, guess what the third one is? Giraffa, well done, good. And they're all over this area. And then the Angolan giraffe is found up in Angola, but they won't occur together. So although I suppose different subspecies might be considered uh, breeds, they are not. All right. That's the giraffe talk for the day. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. It's probably time to move on, shall we? Why is... Oh, they're in black and white that side, aren't they? We, it's only us that are green. Now, remember, everybody, tomorrow, because our drone... Come on, Rusty. ...has not been performing as it should during the course of the mornings. That's Thelma. Uh, she's been beaten senseless today and driven over a few times. And uh, Sebastian has uh, threatened her severely. And now she seems to be working. That's young Thelma. And she is, in fact, totally inanimate, so I'm not being violent. I'm also joking. And because she has not been performing properly, what we've decided to do is to go out normal time at 5.30, take her up and spend an hour with her, and if we find anything, then we'll go live. And if she starts to perform like she, she's supposed to, otherwise we'll be live from half past six to half past eight. So just for two hours tomorrow morning, uh, while we sort out those technical troubles. If uh, within a day or two we've sorted them out, and she's performing consistently, then we'll go back to the normal three hours. So we just need a little bit of time to spend sorting out the technical glitches with the drone. So that's what's going to happen tomorrow. So when we are not live at 5.30, please don't worry. We will be live again at 6.30 in the morning, Central African time. You can work out what time that is wherever you are in the world. turn on a bit more light, retrieve my spotlight, and then go into my own night vision mode while we go across to Steph. We are already in our night vision mode and, uh, and that means that we have got an infrared, uh, the camera is able to pick up infrared and we have an infrared light that's just next to the camera which means that uh, in near 
pitch black or in pitch blackness something that i wouldn't be able to see it does mean that we'll be able to look at animals uh, and not disturb them with a big bright spotlight and uh, and hopefully see some uh, some decent action without uh, without bothering them at all or bothering them less i should say now we've managed to come around on a loop road around uh, that group of tourists having a sundowner and um, we passed them and they said that the hyenas came past, didn't even bat an eyelid, walked straight past them and carried on going into the block. And so what we're going to carry on doing is just making loops and see if we could pick up uh, Dune and Corky, which are the two spotted hyenas that we saw just a, a few minutes ago, and see if we can follow them for as long as we are able to. I mean, we might as well. Um, and see where they take us, basically. That's what I'm hoping to do over the next few minutes. Now, Namaste, you want to know, and it's the burning question at the moment, are these, uh, are these ahinas denning on, uh, on Juma at the moment? Namaste, I don't actually know if they are. I think that they're... Here we go, we've got ahina right here. Oh, that does luck. Um, look at these two guys, right where the group were having their sundowners. <laughs> you guys are naughty. So there you go. I don't know what they're looking at. Something down there is catching her attention. Um, I'm hoping that their den is somewhere close by. This morning I saw a lot of footprints in the Mulwati leading into this area. And both of these females don't look that old. And I'm wondering if they're not associated to a den. There are a couple of old den sites in this area and so when I can start walking again I'm gonna high tail it here one morning or one afternoon and we're gonna come and stick our noses into the these den sites and see if we can pick up um, where the den has moved to I'm really hoping that it's on on Juma again hyena den sites are such good value now you can see that this grass is uh, is much shorter than the surrounding grass and that's because Rex and mowed it short recently and that's just because it, he's wanting it to be a little bit safer for tourists coming to have sundowners down here doesn't want the long grass around which is really really good well, Rexon did a good job and uh... so Crystal you're still watching thankfully and you say that the one that we're watching now is called Corky so, Crystal, why don't you share with us how you know that this is Corky? What is the spot pattern that you're having a look at? And, uh, and Crystal says to me right now through Kirsty that it's because there's a missing left ear tip. She is in good condition though, Crystal, so rest assured she is very good. Now, what's funny is they just changed direction again and they're now going east again. Now, Joy, you would like to know if mating pairs have a mating ritual. Um, that's a good question, Joy. I think that, you know, to a degree, I think with hyenas being female hyena, particularly matriarchs who get mated with the most, they're so full of testosterone, they're so big that you probably find that a subordinate male of low rank that needs to mate to this female has to do quite an elaborate, uh, quite an elaborate courtship display, and I, I would imagining, I would imagine it, uh, it comprises of much groveling and sand diving, and they they, they walk on their knees. Um, there's a term for it, but I, I forget it right now. Um, okay, they are walking up here. Let's see if we can pick them up on the other side. There is a road close by. Um, so I would imagine that it's a lot of submissive behavior, a lot of groveling of some sorts, and that it's quite uh, well documented in Richard Estes' uh, Behavioral Guide to African Mammals. Um, we can go through it in a little bit when I can stop and I'll be able to tell you what it is. Off the top of my head, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen it, and so I wouldn't be able to really comment on, on what it is, but it must be documented. People have spent lifetime's worth of time 
with spotted hyenas and documented it all and so it must be out there. So these two hyena are on the road. We wanted to follow hyena tonight and we've got it right. So we won't follow too closely. I don't want to disturb them. I want them to do what they would be doing if we weren't here. And so I can hardly see them at the moment. In actual fact, I can just see the back of, if this is Corky, you can just see the back, but you can quite easily see Dune in the front. If I hear it correctly, Kirsty, Coast Spider, you'd like to know if they've got a keen sense of smell. Um, Coast Cider, sorry. Um, you'd like to know if they've got a keen sense of smell. They absolutely do. Um, you know, they respond to kills and to, and, and you know, of, of leopard that have killed something the day before and all of a sudden a hyena will come up. But there's no way that they could have heard that. They're smelling this over sometimes the distances of kilometers worth. I would hazard to say that not quite as far as 10 kilometers unless the terrain allowed for it and there was a strong enough breeze, but definitely out to five kilometers, that would be no problem for a hyena to smell a kill um, and respond that way. Now these are doing what hyenas do patrolling now they'll do a mixture of a bunch of things they will patrol and scent mark as they go along using quite an elaborate olfactory system uh, which comprises glandular secretions out of an anal pouch that they smear onto bushes and trees um, they will call and whoop and they patrol basically and uh, just their patrolling, you know, leaves their smelly footprints all over the place, they'll roll themselves in the sand and but at the same time they will respond to any distress calls that they hear, so if a leopard or lion had to catch something it makes a distress call at the moment of impact and there's a very good chance, well there is, they will respond if they can hear that. Let's carry on going over here. If we're lucky, we may be lucky and be taken to a den site Praise, you'd like to know if a hyena would eat a snake. I've never seen it with my own eyes. And the two massive snake kills that I've managed to see over the years, both were pythons. One was killed by a leopard, the other one was killed by a honey badger. Rotted completely. Not a vulture or a hyena ate even one single morsel of both of those carcasses. So in my experience, I'm going to say no. Um, but I can't imagine why. To this day, I still don't understand why those hyena didn't eat the, the python carcasses. Um, and there were hyena footprints all over the place in both carcasses. So it wasn't like it wasn't uh, investigated by, by the hyena. Um, just for some reason, they left it. As for smaller snakes, I wouldn't know. I, I haven't found any remains of, uh, of any snakes. I would imagine that as carrion though, that it's completely feasible that they would do it. So my experience, no. Is it feasible? Absolutely. Yeah, they're still walking in the dark. Now oh, they're running somewhere, nose up, so got a smell in the nose. Where are you going? Running particularly fast, actually. Where are you going? And galloping off, obviously smelt or heard something and is now, you know, goodbye, see you later. <laughs> they will chase down their own prey. Um, I remember excitedly uh, um, having dinner at Bush Lodge at Sabi Sabi one, uh, one night and hyenas chased, four hyenas chased a full-grown kudu bull into the pan in front of the lodge and killed it in the water. Um, hyenas have also chased, uh, during my time there, chased an impala into the staff village, into someone's bedroom and through the window um, out into the bush on the other side. They followed it out through the room and out the window. So <laughs> there are some amazing things that hyenas can do. And then uh, in East Africa, in Tanzania, where I've worked before, um, I watched some hyena pull down a buffalo, a full-grown buffalo. And so they definitely are very accomplished hunters. And 
Right, I'm going to go out onto the main road here. We just saw a car pass and see if we can catch up with uh, with those two Ahina. In the meantime, why don't we go and hear if James has got some exciting Ahina stories for you. Hmm? I don't think I have any exciting hyena stories at all, actually. Just trying to think. Uh, I have st shrunk slightly, you'll see, and that's not because I've aged substantially since he last saw me. It's because Sebastian forgot to bring his blanket with him, and I was sitting on one to make me a little bit taller, and so I had to donate it to him. Thanks, My pleasure. It's, I nice warm. it's warm, good. I can barely see over the steering wheel at this stage, but that's all right. Who needs to see this steering wheel? I'm trying to think of an exciting hyena story. Hyenas. Well, the most exciting hyena story is the one... No, not the one that came into camp and I had to chase it. That's an amusing story. It's not a very interesting one. Uh, the most amusing one, or interesting one, was the wild dog and hyena interaction we had in the northern boundary one day, where... I don't know, I, well, the wild dogs had killed a young kudu, I think, and some hyenas came in from our Juma clan, and they had an almighty fight. And the dogs managed to corner one of the hyenas up against a bush. She turned her backside into the thorn bush so that they couldn't get at it, and then they became quite nervous about getting at her business end. But what really stood out about that sighting was the immense noise that they all made. A hyena in distress or in anger makes a wailing growl that will chill your blood until it turns icy blue. It really is a dreadful sound. It makes you feel afraid and sorry for the thing all at the same time. While the wild dogs made their chittering and chattering. That was the best one I had. Um, I did have to chase a hyena out of camp once, butt naked. Um, there's a dike in the road. Uh, I didn't choose to chase it you know, naked. Unfortunately, I got out of bed, forgot that I wasn't wearing anything, and leapt out of my room as I heard this thing attacking the dustbins, and then realized that I had no clothes on. Mercifully, there's a dyker, mercifully nothing or no one else emerged from their rooms, otherwise they'd have been slightly shocked. Almost as shocked as the hyena was. He stared for a while before running away. And then I scuttled back into my room and shut the door quickly before anyone could come out. I'm not going to repeat what Kirsten said to me. She's been very rude. She's a very rude person. Let's continue. They're quite nice to find some hyenas, actually. I miss very much having a hyena den at Juma, where we can go and sit with them and enjoy the cubs. And they're growing up. The inevitable fights over naming them. It's quite funny. I'm very grateful to those of you who do keep up with the hyenas that all of the identikits that you've made and all of the um, time that you spend on them because obviously you identify them very quickly, which is fantastic. Corky was the kind of first favourite of mine. She was called Corky, in case you're wondering, because she had a habit of corking the top of the den. So she'd sit inside the den. I mean, lots of hyenas do this. She's just was the one that I first happened to sort of spend any time with that did it. And there she would suckle her youngster inside. That's why she's called Corky. And I think June was her daughter, wasn't she? Was June her daughter? I don't remember. It's so long ago now. It's got two years ago that we had all of those wonderful wonderful hyena sightings. I don't think June is right, actually, because I seem to recall it being... No, it wasn't winter. I don't know. Could have been June. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I see tracks here of human beings. David and... Oops. David and Steph came running here. 
I am Brian. No, the answer would be they do not go out of their way to hunt hyenas. They will absolutely take them to pieces if they can get hold of them, but they won't go out of their way to hunt them. If they hear them on a kill, they may well stalk up to them as opposed to just charge in and see if they can grab one. I suppose that might be described as an active hunt, but they'd never wake up in the night and go on an active hyena raiding party. It would just be a waste of their energy, you know. They only need to whack hyenas if they come across them and they feel like their food is being threatened. But they won't actually go and look for them. Unless they feel like food is in the offing, of course. Alright, I'm not sure if Steph's managed to keep up with this hyena, but let's go and find out. No, we didn't. In actual fact, they ran away from us and uh, we lost them in the thick bush. But from that head up and the direction that they were going in, I would assume that... that well, uh, let me say, I'm hoping for the, the, the fact that Tingana might have, uh, might have caught something and they were reacting to that. And so tomorrow, it would definitely be a good idea to go and have a look in the last place that Tingana was seen and to see if there's anything there. Hopefully if there is and he did catch something, he's put it into a tree before they get there and, uh, and we can have a look at it. Um, but no, hyena can, can keep a sustained speed of over 40 kilometers an hour and in bursts go up to 70 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour and almost impossible to keep up. And they can keep up that 40 kilometers an hour for kilometer after kilometer. They just are the most unbelievably well-engineered animals for stamina. And uh, they weren't running on a road, and so very difficult to keep up. Impossible, in fact, to keep up, unless we had an airplane or that thermal drone that we have to play with. So we've changed direction. We're now going in a different direction. And I see we've got some lights in front of us, so we're going to have to pull off the road over here for this, uh, for this vehicle to come past. So we'll probably have to stop and say hello, but we won't stop for too long. Let me switch off all my lights so that I don't blind anyone. There we go. I think while I do a little bit of housekeeping over here, it'll be a good idea just to go through to James and we'll catch you up on the other side of this. Hmm? Housekeeping? What housekeeping is he going to do? How is he going to housekeep? Oh, apparently he's going to be a chatty Cathy. I'd like to see Kirsten call Steph chatty Cathy to his face. That'd be quite amusing. We'll set it up and do it live. <laughs> she said she'll do it all right. She would too. She's fairly terrifying. Not fairly terrifying, very. And we've got two of them now. Two redheads, vampires, people without souls. Now, final control is silent, you see. They're conjuring a, they're conjuring a spell to put on me when I get home. All right, in the last few minutes, as I desperately try and find something worth talking about, um, just remind you, tomorrow we're going to be live from 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning. The first hour will have from 5.30 to 6.30 we'll be testing the drone. If we do find something that is of use, we'll go live to Facebook. So if you happen to be up at that time, well, many of you will be, I suppose, just keep an eye on your Facebook notifications and we'll be vectoring Steph into some sightings, hopefully, with the drone. And then we'll do normal drive from 6.30 to 8.30 and that's just for as long as it takes for us to sort out the tech difficulties with the drone because we don't want to have what we had this morning, well, the morning before especially, where we took off, had to land, come back to camp, take off again. Monique, Monique, you are now Kirsten's best friend in the whole world. You say you'd rather have red hair than no hair. I think that's perfectly valid. Uh, I think I would probably rather have red hair than no hair as well. I just can't imagine myself as a redhead. <laughs> That'd be quite funny. 
as a larange. Kirsten says it would not be attractive. Well, I think it might. I think red hair would suit me. Would suit my Scottish looks. Any people what? Uh, only certain people can pull it off. I see. Well, that's very lucky that Kirsten is able to pull it off. Sort of. Okay. Yes, it was almost a compliment. Okay. I doesn't like to give too many compliments. People get blasé. Right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on our drive. Very pleasant it was. I saw some nice things. Honey badgers. Tingana, um, Scuba, Steve and Sarah, of course, I must not forget them. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for your questions and comments. Tomorrow at 06.30. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>